including discussions of climate resilience practices in the NPS programs. We've got an uh, overview of the USDA Climate Hub, which is a resource for understanding and addressing the effects of climate change on agriculture and forestry. And we're going to hear updates from a couple of states that have incorporated climate considerations into their nonpoint management plans. And then the last session will be a discussion on what's happening out there in the states, uh, uh, what kind of actions people are taking to incorporate climate change. So for our first presentation here on EPA's National Water Program's response to climate change, we have Jeff Peterson from EPA headquarters. Good morning, everyone. I'm thrilled to be at a national non-point source training. I've been working uh, at EPA and on climate change, specifically on climate change now for almost 10 years. And uh, this is the first chance I've had to talk to a national group about focused on non-point. And I'm thrilled that you all are interested in climate change. And I'd like to give you just a little bit of an overview of some of the uh, national level and interagency work that we've been doing on climate change and talk a little bit about specifically how the 319 program uh, is already fitting into some of that work and maybe a few ideas for future directions. But really the first thing I wanted to say is that contrary to the popular idea of climate change, which is, well, it's warming up, everything's getting warmer, it's going to be hotter. and Really, though, so many of the things that happen as a result of climate change and, and getting warmer play out in the context of water and water resources. And this is just a nice quote that sort of summarizes that and gives you the idea that uh, the air program has a lot to do with climate change, but it's important to remember that water programs have uh, almost more of the impact of climate change than any other part of environmental protection. I'm, hope, I'm hoping this is mostly uh, pretty obvious to everybody in the room, but just so we're all kind of starting from the same page, remember that uh, some of the water effects of a changing climate include not just warmer air, but warmer water temperatures, changing patterns of precipitation, lots uh, more rain in some parts of the country, like the Midwest, and lots less in, for instance, the Southwest. Uh, earlier snow melt, uh, more extreme weather events, increased drought, uh, of course, sea level rise and storm surge, and then a whole panoply of complicated effects on coastal areas, including ocean acidification. So today, I have uh, a couple of objectives with you here. The first is to give you a really high-level, big picture of some of the work that's going on in Washington that EPA has been participating in, focusing specifically on climate change adaptation, not so much the greenhouse gas reduction mitigation side of the, of the world. Uh, second is to then focus in a little bit on, well, what is EPA doing specifically and, in particular, the National Water Program? And as I do that, I want to really highlight some of the tools that we have developed to help decision makers think through climate change impacts and apply new information that's coming out, out in easy, useful ways to the kinds of challenges they're facing every day. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about the climate aspects of the 319 program. So the the really high 40,000-foot level view of the federal government's response to climate change is kind of summed up in this slide. Uh, the President's Climate Action Plan really is the foundation of uh, all the work that's related to climate change. The, the President's Action Plan addresses mitigation and also international cooperation, but there's a core element of it uh, focused on adaptation. And then about six months after the uh, action plan came out, uh, we got the Climate Change Executive Order, which really 
gives us a much more detailed operational plan. I'll say a little more about that. Then uh, shortly after that, the third national climate assessment came out. Uh, following that, individual federal agencies developed climate change adaptation plans. And at the same time that individual agencies were developing their adaptation plans, there was an effort among agencies to focus on some key cross-cutting challenges. One of those was water resources. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that. And of course, we have had some really kind of rifle shot efforts looking at, for instance, flood risk management standards. Uh, and there was recently a drought uh, memo from the president and an action plan on that. So just to give you the big picture framework of the president's action plan as it relates to climate adaptation, uh, there were three big ideas. The first is that we need to focus on building communities that are ready for climate change and ready to adapt to climate change, particularly in their infrastructure and in their water infrastructure. So you see within the narrative of that uh, part of the plan reference to investments in infrastructure, including, for instance, our state revolving fund investments. The second key idea was to protect the economy and natural resources. And in that part of the plan, you see more attention to topics like preparation for flooding, advanced preparation to avoid flooding, uh, advanced preparation to deal with drought, uh, that kind of idea. And then the third is sound science to manage impacts. And we've really, I think, come a long way in just a short time on this in terms of organizing all the various data and information systems across the federal government and in state and local governments and the private sector to not just make those data sets interoperable and available on the internet, but then to build the tools that interrogate those data systems and give you the kind of information that you can use without having to redesign that thinking all for yourself every time. And then the executive order, 13653, takes all of that work to another more detailed level. It calls for modernizing federal programs to be more resilient than the agency plans that I mentioned. Uh, it called for a report that focused specifically on natural resources, including topics like uh, how to sequester carbon in the natural environment, as well as uh, looking particularly at water resources. Uh, we've developed the information and tools, including the climate change tools portal. Uh, and there is now a federal interagency preparedness council. And we had for several years a state and tribal uh, and local task force looking at climate adaptation and making recommendations. And then the National Climate Assessment really did focus in on uh, the most current information about climate change. And when you look at that, I think you'll find that so much of the entire assessment actually relates to water and water resources. Uh, there is a chapter on water resources implications of climate change. And then throughout other chapters, water keeps popping up. Water, energy, and land use is another chapter. Uh, urban systems, infrastructure, and vulnerability. Turns out that's mostly about water infrastructure, uh, wastewater and drinking water. Uh, decision support tools and adaptation uh, sections also deal a lot with water. And then a big important part of the National Climate Assessment is the individual chapters on regional impacts that vary so much around the country. And in each of those regional chapters, there's a section on the specific implications uh, for water resources in that region. So that's sort of the, the generic climate adaptation work. Uh, while that's been going on, the water resources community uh, among federal agencies at the headquarters level really uh, felt like we had to get our act together and think about how we could be better coordinated. Uh, so this is people like uh, NOAA, uh, Department of Interior, USGS, uh, FEMA, 
Army Corps of Engineers, um, other federal agencies with specific water management interests. Uh, in 2011, they published uh, interagency climate adaptation uh, a national action plan looking at key areas like how to improve water information, how to strengthen the vulnerability assessments for water-related uh, infrastructure and facilities, how to expand water use efficiency programs, and uh, how to support integrated water resources management, which in general doesn't have a specific climate focus, but I think as we looked at that question, we concluded that if we were doing a better job across the board with an integrated water resource management approach, we would be doing a lot better with climate change. There's also some discussion about supporting training and outreach. So that's the national interagency picture, focusing in now on the Environmental Protection Agency is just kind of one, one slice of that bigger pie. Uh, EPA has been uh, affirmatively on the problem of climate change adaptation, I'm proud to say, uh, going back to our 2011 uh, National Climate Adaptation Policy. Uh, and in 2012, the National Water Program developed our uh, uh, National Climate Adaptation Strategy, which I'll say more about in a minute. But uh, as a result of the agency's commitment to put together a coordinated cross-EPA approach to climate adaptation, each individual program office within headquarters was assigned the job of developing a climate adaptation plan. So the Superfund RICRA program has a climate adaptation plan. The AIR program has a climate adaptation plan. The pesticides program has a climate adaptation plan. And of course the water program, even though we already had our, our own strategy, we did one of those to fit that model. Uh, so uh, the headquarters programs fought this through we did not forget about the regions. Each of the 10 regional offices has done the same kind of climate adaptation planning. So our national 2012 strategy, which is really our guiding framework and what we use to sort of manage and, and advance our overall program, uh, includes focuses, a focus on these five topics. Uh, infrastructure, of course, that's both wastewater and drinking water. Watersheds and wetlands, where there are lots of climate-related implications, which I'll, I'll touch on more in a minute. Coastal and ocean waters, uh, more specifically water quality and the challenges directly for water quality, and then uh, some specific ideas on working with tribes. So rather than try and go through each of those five areas in detail, I, I don't kind of have the time this morning, but I do want to give you some highlights of the sorts of uh, program efforts that have evolved from this planning framework. So just hitting a couple of them uh, here, one is our Climate Ready Water Utilities Program. Uh, this is focused specifically on helping individual water utilities think through their climate challenges. Uh, we've got things like an adaptation strategies guide uh, and here we have uh, a tool called the Climate Resilience Evaluation and Awareness Tool, CREATE for short. Uh, we've just published the third version of CREATE, and it's a software tool now available online, interoperable on the internet, that walks a water utility through the various scenarios that a changing climate may present them over the next 20, 40, 50 years. It helps them assess how that changing climate may affect their actual operations and helps them think through what are the potential costs of doing something, not doing something, uh, what are the energy implications, and what are the operational opportunities and implications. And the more we got into this whole problem, the more it became clear that one of the most direct and immediate threats to water utilities comes from storm surge inundation and hurricanes. Certainly you couldn't, anyone who went through Hurricane Sandy, I think would probably see the, uh, the need to begin to focus on this challenge. So 
we have uh, spent considerable time and effort to really think through where the most significant storm surge risks are likely to occur along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts. And we put together this tool uh, to help water utilities better understand specifically storm surge as opposed to the more generic sea level rise challenge. Another implementation highlight is our Climate Ready Estuaries Program. And uh, we have helped individual national estuaries, our 28 national estuaries, work on climate adaptation projects around the country uh, within their individual programs. Uh, we've also developed a, uh, what we call a workbook for climate change adaptation on a watershed basis. It was focused on estuaries, but it really works on watersheds uh, anywhere. It helps identify vulnerabilities and uh, to support evaluating relative risks. Not all risks are the same, obviously, but it's been hard, I think, for people to put them in kind of perspective. So this workbook really helps with that. It also helps for defining where do you go to think about possible response actions once you think you've identified your risks and your highest priority risk. We also have our water sense program, and uh, I won't, I'll, I think I'll, I'll leave that, details of that, and I'm happy to come back to that in questions, but uh, another tool that we have framed up to help people think about how the climate's changing uh, is our stormwater assessment tool, which helps people on the ground in stormwater planning programs think about how the climate's going to affect stormwater and the management of BMPs. We also have our, uh, some work underway to develop some additional tools, mostly focused on, on flow. Uh, I'm going to come back to this later in questions. And just to note quickly that we have uh, some training that's available both through the Watershed Academy and through EPA more generally. Uh, I hope if you uh, are interested in uh, some training, you'll take a look at those. I want to just spend one minute on uh, an effort we have with state organizations, national organizations, looking at best practices for climate adaptation. Uh, we have developed 10 specific state practices that help adapt to a climate, changing climate. Here are some examples. Uh, Oregon, uh, water quality standards for temperature, uh, and in Minnesota, a stormwater manual. So we have posted these on the internet, and they're available to help states think through where they're going. In addition, we're thinking hard about where the national programs are going in the next five or 10 years on climate adaptation. We're looking at our SRF programs, our NPDES programs, uh, planning and standards. And just recently, we've uh, decided we want to do the same kind of intensive effort for the non-point source uh, topic. And as we began thinking about non-point pollution and climate change, uh, one sort of initial exercise we did is a, a query of the, the grant information system for the 319 program and thinking about, well, of the topics that are uh, related to climate change that the 319 program has supported, uh, where are those occurring and how many projects might fit into different categories? And we came up with this list of categories that you see here that are, are projects that have a climate adaptation or in some cases a greenhouse gas reduction benefit. So for example, uh, on the general topic of mitigating greenhouse gases, uh, nutrient management plans, as I think you've heard earlier in the, uh, this session, have lots of uh, benefits in terms of both uh, sequestration of carbon, but also by reducing synthetic fertilizers uh, can reduce nitrous oxide emissions and reduce thereby greenhouse gases. And sequestering carbon through uh, no-till agriculture practices or, or just uh, seagrass marsh restoration projects. Uh, invasive species are more likely to be a problem as the climate changes, and there are, uh, per the query of, of the grant system, 89 projects now in the system from the 319 program related to 
invasive species. And for water temperature protection, we found 46 projects. Habitat connectivity, where as the climate changes, aquatic uh, species can adapt and move within a watershed, uh, for instance, through better road culvert design or fish passage removal. We found 34 projects and then 17 projects specifically related to uh, looking at climate adaptation challenges. So just to give you a quick idea of what do those projects actually look like, uh, we just pulled uh, two or three here to give you a little bit more of a, of a sense. This, this is the uh, Kent Conservation District in Delaware, uh, which really was a good example of nutrient management planning that reduced fertilizer application, thereby reducing greenhouse gases through through nitrogen testing and cover crops and, and education on agricultural management practices. Uh, this is the, uh, the Osborne uh, Creek project in Michigan looking at uh, climate connectivity. Uh, this was dealing with undersized culverts and uh, trying to remove the challenges that they posed for both flooding but also for allowing uh, migration of fish up and down uh, the, the tributaries. Here is the, uh, the Chagrin River, uh, Ohio watershed restor or headwaters restoration project with the removal of some low head dams and stabilizing stream bank, uh, again, improving connectivity uh, for uh, the watershed. And the Galenus uh, Village River Floodplain Restoration Project had a specific benefit of improving water quality, but also reducing temperature loads. So obviously there's a connection to climate adaptation there, uh, as well as uh, mitigating floods and, and wildfires. So those are some examples of how the non-point source program is already engaging the whole topic of climate adaptation. I hope there's a chance for uh, some discussion here as we go forward with what more we might do specifically within the 319 program or perhaps more generally in uh, looking at the non-point source challenge. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Or All right, thanks, Jeff. That's a like. great overview. Major major challenges for human infrastructure and natural infrastructure. Any questions for Jeff on this quick overview of the EPA water program response to climate change? Where do we begin? <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. That was a whirlwind tour. Um, I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about interagency cooperation. What I've seen here in New England is a town that used to create tools for their wastewater plants through their DPW, and then the next year they were doing a study under FEMA with their conservation commissioner, and they weren't coordinated. And I mean, there's a top-down, bottom-up issue here, but if we could coordinate better with an agency like FEMA that has money for these kind of studies when we have some technical expertise that we can um, put in. I think we might be able to get some of these towns, on the, particularly on the coast where there's some major problems coming, to do a more coordinated job where they actually might move forward into implementation rather than study, study, study. So I, I absolutely appreciate that um, there's going to be some uncertainty and uh, probably even some confusion as federal agencies try and sort out their own roles with respect to one another uh, and their delivery of not just basic data but the kinds of technical assistance that they keep hearing uh, is needed. So. We are trying to kind of avoid stepping on each other's toes across federal agencies. Uh, without giving you a long list of coordination efforts, it's probably worth noting that um, I think our, our next speaker actually is, is representing USDA's uh, focused interest in 
uh, regional delivery of climate information and services through the, the USDA hub. Other federal agencies have similar regional deployments. Uh, for instance, uh, NOAA has their RESA programs, which is in some parts of the country, but not in others. And uh, Department of Interior has their programs for climate science centers, as well as landscape conservation cooperatives. At the headquarters level, we are doing everything we can to have those agencies that have these regional deployments, not, not to mention EPA's regional offices, talk to one another at the regional level so that the general ambition at headquarters is we shouldn't be stepping on each other's toes does get translated into better coordination and cooperation at the regional and local, state and local level. We have a long way to go, however, and I, I think that's going to be a problem uh, for a while, uh, but we're trying to get better at it. Other questions? Okay. Pass this down. Uh, this isn't so much a question, but just uh, since you brought up um, um, wanting to uh, connect more with FEMA, the um, Office of Sustainable Communities has a um, MOU with, with FEMA specifically to kind of address that. And the person at headquarters managing the, uh, the MOU is uh, Ad Hill Cacker, and they do have a network of, um, of uh, people set up in the different regions uh, just to um, facilitate communication on issues like that. Jeff, can you, um, I don't know, either flashback or tell us how we can get the information regarding the 10 best practices for climate change that you mentioned about sure. halfway through your talk? Well, the, uh, I don't think the actual, uh, so the, these are the, the state organizations we worked with on that. Uh, our website, which is, uh, I'll go back to that in a second, it's on the last page, but the National Water Program website has a subpage for uh, state practices. You'll find the state practices there, and these state organizations uh, that you see here, in particular, Aqua and the wetland managers uh, have also posted those uh, with a link to our website, so you can find them in either place. And we we do expect, we have ten up now. In a couple months, we'll have another ten, I think. So, do you know? Of, uh, is there a tool for quantifying the impacts of? Uh, climate change. The reason I ask that is we have good modeling data in the District of Columbia of, you know, how floodplains are going to change. But um, in applying for FEMA grants, one of the things that we're always asked is, what is the you know property damage uh, expected, and with the changes that you're proposing, you know, what would be the reduction in that in that? And we don't have any way of quantifying that that I know of. So one way to quantify it is to try and monetize it. And uh, until recently, most of the tools that you would find generally available did not speak to quantifying uh, or monetizing. The new version of the Create tool, version 3.0, does take a big step in that direction and does specifically speak to costs and benefits and monetizes some of those costs for water utilities. There, so, so that's just one part of the larger question. In the private sector, some of the NGO tools that you'll find, I, I didn't go into some of them here, but some of them, particularly the sea level rise tools, include some quantification, monetary quantification, based on uh, assessed value of properties expected to be flooded in a particular place. So. There has not been much of that. It's coming now a little bit, and I think you'll see a lot more of that in the next couple of years. All right. Well, let's move a little deeper into this subject with our next speaker. Thanks again, Jeff, for that overview. Uh, next up, we have a look at the USDA Climate Hub's uh, role in promoting resiliency in agriculture and forestry with David Hollinger from the USDA Forest Service. All right, yeah, the incursion of PowerPoint, which I had to learn myself when I came up here. See, that's you there, Hollinger. Hopefully, you 
who you're recognizing now. And uh, right forward, left, backwards, or you can use these either. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, and, and thank you very much for in inviting me to the uh, your non-point source workshop today. I must admit I was not up um, sort of practicing or uh, going over my talk last night, and when the rain delay came, it almost killed me. But um, so, so I am the uh, the director of the Northeast Hub, uh, which will all kind of pieces will fit together a little bit better as we move along. Uh, Randy Johnson, I want to acknowledge uh, Randy and Rachel Steele are both in our national office. Randy is our national lead, or I should say was our national lead until Monday, or last Monday. So Dan Lawson within the Natural Resources Conservation Services has taken over. So we're in the kind of transition process at the national level. So the Climate Hubs came about, at least one of the reasons why the Climate Hubs came about within the USDA as their response to the, the issue of, of climate change is because there was a perception, and really more than a perception, a, a, a belief that within the agency there was a real lack in terms of translating the science climate change and the science of dealing with climate change in the agriculture and forestry world to the actual outreach practices and to the sort of land managers, the farmers, and the foresters in this country. So really the hubs came about as, as a way to improve the packaging uh, and sort of information transfer uh, of this work. So there we are. Um, uh, of course, there was another reason as well. Many other agencies had uh, sort of regional kind of approaches to climate change. In uh, the USDA did not, and I think it realized the Department of Interior had their um, climate science centers. NOAA had the regional uh, climate centers. So uh, I think we wanted to be sort of organized in, in much the same way. Uh, another aspect of the hubs, which has really uh, proven, I, I think, very important is that the hubs do serve to sort of increase the stakeholder feedback, the, the needs of farmers, the needs of foresters in terms of climate change, and helping to sort of steer research and some of the outreach programs that we have within the agency. Uh, Jeff sort of um, touched on this for, for the uh, climate hubs. It was the same sort of beginnings, uh, the President's Climate Action Plan, which came out, I think, in June of 2013. And as, as Jeff showed, there were three sort of uh, overarching areas. Uh, the climate hubs come squarely in, in area number two, preparing the United States for uh, the impacts of climate change. And uh, right there, I think it was on page 17, the climate hubs showed up in the, in the President's Climate Action Plan. And that was the first most of us within the USDA had even heard about these things. Um, and. and uh, <laughs> which was interesting for many of us because we were then tasked to sort of organize and operate a climate hub um, without having a, uh, an operating manual. But that's made it fun and exciting because you just make it up as you go along. So in, in February of, uh, I guess, just a little over a couple of years ago, the USDA announced their regional hubs. They decided to go to the regional approach because uh, the issues in agriculture and forestry differ across the country. And, of course, the climate impacts, as we all know, are also different in, in different regions. Uh, in the Northeast here, we're experiencing wetter conditions, and those are uh, most likely going to continue that way and as a, compared to the sort of mega droughts out in the Southwest. Uh, the, the climate hubs, I will say, also are a relatively modest program. They're designed to sort of cross the 20-something agencies of, of USDA. Um, but in all, I think there are probably 40 or 50 FTEs, and the program size is, at this point is less than um, $10 million. Uh, but since the Climate Hub's main purpose is to sort of interact and develop partnerships, um, you know, I think they, they feel that they can get a lot for, for that investment. So here's the uh, official sort of USDA um, vision of the hubs and their mission. Uh, you can see that we uh, focus on, you know, helping our partners in all of this kind of confusing sort of bureaucratic speak. Uh, what it really comes down to is trying to help the sort of people, farmers, uh, 
foresters, other landowners preserve their land and, and maintain a profit if that's their goal. So the big focus of the climate hubs is on managed lands. Um, there are other parts within the, age, within the government which may focus on wild lands or um, you know, seacoasts and, and whatnot. But that's, that's our little niche within this space. Now, within the USDA and outside of the USDA, there were a number of assets already available, and the challenge of the hubs was then just sort of channeling these and uh, you know, improving the effectiveness of this delivery. Uh, there's a broad range of sort of fundamental climate change research in the US, even with regard to agriculture and, uh, and forestry. I won't kind of go over this too much, just to say that this is a Within the agency, we have the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, which is a um, competitive grants program, as long as the Agricultural Research Service, uh, which is almost a billion dollar agency focused on sort of uh, applied research for farm, primarily within the agricultural sphere. The Forest Service itself does a, uh, several hundred million dollars worth of research to sort of support the forest lands of this country. Um, there were also a number of existing outreach avenues, um, both within the government and outside of the government, and here are a number of uh, uh, different areas. Uh, what was kind of interesting is uh, a researcher at Purdue, Linda Prokopi, did a study a couple of years ago where she talked to farmers and basically asked them, who do you trust to deliver information? And the results were kind of disturbing, at least for those of us in the government, because the, uh, the results were not the university pro professors, the state climatologists, um, or the USDA service centers uh, that were all designed to do that. Um, of course, there was a certain amount of trust. But the most trusted source, uh, aside from friends and families, which you might expect, uh, were folks that farmers and landowners interacted with every day. Their seed dealers, their fertilizer sales uh, people, and also um, certified crop in consultants. The people, the sort of larger farmers may sort of contract with to sort of um, manage the, the business of, of farming. So we re realized we had, <laughs> kind of had our work cut out for us. Uh, this just kind of goes over some of the programs within USDA. Uh, I probably, there's not really a lot of, probably no purpose in, in spending too much time with this, but within, within the USDA, these bars are sort of trying to show which aspects of research uh, these areas uh, cover. I mentioned the uh, National Institute of Food and Agriculture, sort of a um, competitive grants program. I mentioned the Agricultural Research Service, also um, basic research, and I mentioned the Forest Service research. I do want to talk about the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or the NRCS, because the NRCS uh, carries out a tremendous amount of, of sort of applied and outreach activities. That's their whole purpose of being, and the, the NRCS are really fundamental sort of key members of, of the hubs in terms of delivering, uh, delivering the products. But we interact with all of the agencies, the Farm Service Agency, Risk Management, Rural Development, uh, APHIS, the sort of uh, kind of uh, bug and pest people, as, as well as some of the other minor agencies. And of course, yes, the most valuable asset are people, and I guess I'm hanging out in that picture somewhere. Um, the USDA then puts this all together. I won't, you know, this is the big picture, how it all fits. It's kind of irrelevant, I think, for this audience. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about the specific activities that the, the hubs are involved in and then try to circle back to the, the key issues of, of non-point uh, non source pollution and how the hubs and folks in this room can, uh, can interact and, and move forward because there are some very clear areas where our interests coincide almost exactly. So within the hubs, um, a little bit of information that eventually sort of trickled down on, on what they wanted us to do is they basically wanted us to conduct activities in these six different areas. And I'll just go through with a few quick examples in these, in these different areas. Um, partnerships, uh, first of all, they wanted to see partnerships with other federal agencies also tasked with managing lands or uh, already tasked with delivering sort of climate 
science and climate impact information. Uh, so our sort of obvious sort of partners, the climate science centers, uh, regional efforts from the Department of Interior. Uh, the DOI, a different part of the DOI, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service also runs landscape conservation cooperatives. Their focus is a little bit different. They are really the sort of endangered species people. Um, but of course, climate change has, has a strong sort of um, impact on, on many of their programs as well. Uh, we interact with NOAA, both the regional climate centers. Their mission is to deliver the climate data. Our mission is to take that climate data, understand it, and try to understand how that's going to uh, impact people's operations. And then, as Jeff mentioned before, there are also the regional integrated science and assessment sort of programs, the RISAs. Um, those are regional, but they are also typically topic focused. So there, in the Northeast, for example, there is an urban RISA you're, many of you, you may be familiar with. There's also a new sort of mid-Atlantic RISA uh, that just was announced last week that's focused on Chesapeake Bay and some of the key issues, um, nutrient runoff, water quality um, in, in that area. Uh, another key partnership is something called Cooperative Extension. Uh, in this country, uh, all of the states have land-grant colleges. They are funded in part by the Department of Agriculture, and part of that funding is to carry out outreach activities. So, so this is an asset, if you will, that, that's already in place, and the agency wanted us to sort of talk to Cooperative Extension, who are very busy people uh, and only partly funded by USDA and work with them to sort of carry the message of, of climate change forward while they're carrying all the other messages forward that, that they have. Um, also, they wanted us to sort of work more closely with the regional offices that the USDA has. The USDA has, in every county, pretty much every county of this country, offices where they have employees from the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the Farm Service Agency, uh, and also sometimes Risk Management Agency. The NRCS is a great program because they offer carrots. They have a number of programs where to encourage sort of actions that conserve soil, conserve water quality, and they will pay sort of producers to enroll in these programs. Um, they don't have any sticks, they just have carrots. And um, the Farm Service Agency is more of a disaster sort of um, uh, agency. So in the Northeast, for example, we had an unprecedented or, well, a, a, a drought which had not been seen for probably 50 years or so. Um, the areas, the region, many of the states in the region were declared disaster areas. And with that declaration, that, that freed up and triggered a number of programs within the Farm Service Agency that, that farmers could, could enroll in. So tighter, uh, tighter, tighter ties with, with both of those organizations. Um, in terms of research, research was sort of in, in quotes there because the hubs were not designed to do research, um, but they were designed to improve the flow of research, understand what the, what the clients needed, and, um, and get that back to our, uh, our folks doing the research. Um, just moving on quickly to the information synthesis side of things, um, like the EPA, uh, there are a number of tools that have been developed that we're trying to promote. Uh, the climate hubs at their national website have something called the tool shed because you know we're agriculture and that's kind of cute and it's where you keep your tools. Um, there are probably over a hundred tools in the tool shed now. Um, some of them are pretty rusty and I wouldn't recommend them, but a, a few of them are, are, are looking pretty good and, and you might find useful. And you can search for these by region or by, by type of tool. Uh, another tool uh, which is we're very excited about are a couple of workbooks that have come out, one for agriculture, one for forestry, and these are aimed at the sort of individual farmer or forest landowner, and they take the, the landowner through a process, if you will, of self-discovery. Um, basically, sort of the issues of climate change, how the climate is changing is sort of explained, uh, but 
the, the user then sort of focuses on how the different aspects of climate change might affect their land, which they, better than anyone else, know how to manage. You know, they have the, the wetter areas, the dry areas, and, the, and it, it leads them through this process to determine for themselves how, how they might do that. Uh, so these are out in um, sort of booklet or PDF form. Uh, the forestry uh, workbook is also available online, and the uh, agricultural workbook is, is moving in that way and should be there soon, too. Um, we also try to synthesize reports. The Forest Service came out with a 300-page report on the impact of drought, and they wanted the hubs to sort of uh, simplify that, so that was boiled down to sort of eight regional two-pagers. Um, and we have a number of other agency tools, such as Comet Farm, which is a greenhouse gas um, tool, and uh, AgBiz Logic, which sort of presents different climate scenarios. It's combined with a spreadsheet and budgeting approach, so farmers can actually look at different crops and how the uh, growing degrees they may change and how that may change their profitability. So tools to just kind of play around with how the future might be changing. Um, the agencies were also tasked with assessments, um, first just summarizing work vulnerabilities in each region, and then more recently uh, coming out with new vulnerability assessments. These are now sort of in progress through the uh, journal Climate Change with the goal of them being assessed, or sorry, being incorporated into the next national climate assessment. So uh, new, new information, regionally based information on agricultural vulnerabilities and forest vulnerabilities too. Um, education, uh, mostly this relates to outreach work. Uh, won't sort of spend too much time on this. And finally, the uh, demonstrations. Um, in many cases, farmers don't know what they can do to increase the sustainability and the, the basically the resilience of their land to the, the changing climate. And of course, that depends upon the region, you know, what is happening, is it going to be getting wetter, going to be getting drier, both things are going to be happening. Uh, one thing which is kind of exciting uh, we're developing, uh, just touch on, is the virtual demonstration process, uh, project. This involves a 360 degree video as well as interviews, so you're sort of right there on the farm and by moving your screen or even better your, your tablet or your phone around, you can sort of hear, the, hear this interview and see this farm in, in different aspects. And, that's kind of kind of fun. So that's that's coming out um, pretty soon. Um, now I just want to take it back very briefly in, in my last few minutes here with the um, sort of non-point source issues. Uh, as as Jeff mentioned, you know we typically think of the temperature increase in uh, as, as sort of the dominant factor in climate change, but really thus far changes in precipitation have really dominated. These are observed changes in heavy precipitation, which is two inches or, or greater uh, over the last 30 or so years. And you can see in the Northeast, you know, we're, really, we're really getting it. Not only are heavy storms becoming more frequent, but the size of the storm uh, are, is also becoming larger. Uh, and that's already having um, consequences for sort of agricultural users, as you uh, no doubt uh, can imagine. Now, within agriculture, just sticking with agriculture, we'll kind of, you know, pass on forestry here. There are a number of ways to manage your land uh, to deal with climate change and non-point source pollution. Uh, within the climate hubs, we are huge fans of the NRCS soil health program. Basically, the idea of building up soil organic matter. This allows soils to hold more moisture and be more resilient to drought. But at the same time, it increases infiltration and uh, reduces runoff. So it's, it's a real win-win. Oh, and it plots it, it, you know, it grows more crops. You know, your, your fields are more productive. So um, there are several ways of improving uh, the health of, of, your, uh, of your soil. One is to reduce your tillage, reduce the amount of plowing that you do. Uh, we're, we're big on sort of no-till, which is the the picture on the bottom left that shows soybeans coming up through some corn residue. Uh, we're also really big on cover crops. These are sort of crops like ryegrass, which is in the, the right-hand photo, uh, which you place on your field when you're not growing your crop, or sometimes you actually you know, place it, it between your crop. Um, both of these methods have been, been proven to um, generally 
boost yields, but, but certainly reduce sort of runoff and, and erosion and, and these sorts of issues. So these are, these are really positive positives for increasing the resilience of a farm to climate change, but also very much positives towards reducing the non-point source pollution. Uh, what's interesting is across the country there is an enormous variance in how much these programs or these practices, I should say, are taken up by farmers. In Maryland and Indiana, for example, more than 35 percent of the uh, land is no-till. Um, in, in Pennsylvania or, or New York, far less. And the same, same applies for cover crops. At the same time, there are a number of practices um, in place now which are really not good for non-point source pollution, and they're not necessarily good um, in terms of increasing the resilience of, of, of a farm. And just two examples are manure application and subsurface drainage. Uh, both of these practices may increase, increase yield or they may deal with a problem, um, manure for example, but there are ways to sort of do both of these things that reduce the non-point source uh, issues. At, at this point, the hubs have not sort of partnered, I would say, with most of the, the people in this room and with the groups in this room. Uh, I do think because of this interaction between non-point source issues and agricultural resilience, that this is sort of a, a ripe area and, and an area that uh, we'd really like to see develop in the, in the oncoming years. And that's kind of it. If you'd like to contact us, uh, my contact information is available, or you can Google Climate Hubs and, and you can find out who, who's involved in your, in your region. So thank you very much. All right, thanks. <laughs> All right, questions. Let's see if a couple hands up on this side. Uh, Andrew Craig from Wisconsin. Um, for David and Jeff's talk, I didn't hear either one of you mention the federal crop insurance program, and that's one of the biggest opportunities for collaboration to steer agriculture towards soil health and greater resiliency for climate change. Uh, can you briefly talk about what opportunities for collaboration can be on that scope or the scale? I think that's a really good point. I, I would say that within within the insurance um, arena, I, I've heard more criticisms about existing programs and, and the disincentives that there might be uh, in terms of taking on practices that in, that increase resilience. Um, you know, some have said, of course, that the insurance allows people to not start adapting to to, to climate change, and, and um, so I, I think. Basically, I, I think all of the programs within USDA um, can be more focused, and I, I would imagine this will likely happen, although there is an election coming up. <laughs> um, I, I would imagine going forward, um, programs such as NRCS, which have climate change benefits, will actually incorporate climate change language, and I, I believe um, some of the insurance programs uh, may also be going in that way. So I haven't really answered. I've just ducked your question. <laughs> but thanks. Maybe we can talk afterwards. So um, I have sort of two questions. The first one is on the uh, EQIP program. Will there be more emphasis in the national points about projects that actually impact that, or practices that you could put in that um, have some ability to mitigate climate impacts. Um, right now there are, uh, you know, when you, when you do those programs, you know, there's such a huge slug of national points and then the things that you care about are very little. And the second question, I was surprised that you didn't mention EPA as one of your partnerships and we do the National Water Quality Monitoring Initiative and it seems like we need to know whether what we're doing is being effective in those areas. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take them backwards. Um, first of all, uh, EPA is a partner, but I would say this is very much an unrealized um, or a, a, an as yet poorly realized partnership. Um, most of the hubs have been focusing uh, with other agencies thus far. 
Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a no-brainer in regions like the Northeast or the Midwest where water quality issues, actually I believe in the Northeast the sort of water quality non-point source issues are probably the single largest uh, and most significant agricultural issue that we're facing. So um, that's on us. In terms of the EQIP program, um, two, two, I guess, two responses. Uh, NRCS is developing a new tool which takes all of their different programs, including EQIP, and you know, juggles around with the points to sort of in, uh, determine kind of climate change uh, resilience impacts. Uh, and that, I think, will influence the agency going forward. Uh, the other aspect about EQIP uh, is the NRCS programs, as I'm sure most of you are aware, are very much state specific and the state conservationist has a lot of say in determining the focus on, on how these programs roll out. So there's a lot of variation. But I will say that uh, Dan Lawson is NRCS. He's um, in the Washington office and talks with their chief. He's in the chief's office. And him becoming a, the, the national lead for the climate hubs uh, is likely to move things in the direction that you're asking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, following up on the uh, observation about the crop insurance, um, as, as sir, I, I can't speak to what's you know what things might be like on the on the East Coast, but in the Midwestern Corn Belt, I mean, there are three real tangible obstacles that we face with with the um, non-point source challenges with climate change. And crop insurance is, is a big one. It's the, it's the farm bill in general is the 800-pound is the gorilla in the room. And I, I'm, it's, this isn't as much a question, it's just an observation, and maybe it's something we can talk about more in the facilitated discussion. But unless there's a change in the way that is structured, we are going to be constantly swimming against a tide with respect to climate change as well as non-point source pollution. The other two observations based on our real life experience dealing with this on a daily basis is ag retailers and their staff are salespeople. They're, they're compensated through, the, and through incentives. They're, they're, we have to find a way to incentivize them to sell cover crops, to sell the kinds of things that we need to be farmers to use to improve the landscape because those are not the things that are giving them the commissions to be able to put bread on the table for their families every day. And, and that, until that economic infrastructure is changed, we are going to be always challenged to get them to help us talk to farmers in the way that we need farmers to be hearing the message about climate change and about controlling runoff. And then third, at least our experience is Cooperative extension is the same. We've got individual extension advisors that are out there discounting climate change, discounting the value of cover crops. So we've got this, this institutional structure out there that could be used, but the way it's set up right now and the way people are incentivized and the way people carry the message at that local level it's not, it's not getting through to the farmer. They're, that's not what the farmer's hearing from the people who they're listening to. Um, I, I generally agree on, on all of those points. Um, I will say uh, we've been working with cooperative extension. And I mean, first of all, the farming community is very conservative. Um, climate change uh, is, is sometimes a hard sell, especially mitigation, you know, that it's human caused. Uh, but they are aware of climate variability. And they are increasingly becoming more aware of that there is a trend in this variability. And, whatnot. And that, so the extension, I think people reflect generally the, the sort of beliefs or the attitudes of those that they serve. Um, going back to the Farm Bill, absolutely that is a huge, uh, very political uh, sort of uh, guideline for what USDA does. Our, our current Secretary of Agriculture, um, Secretary Vilsack, has been a huge sort of um, booster of the agency dealing with climate change. Much of the, the Farm Bill was sort of developed before the current administration. I think if 
those sorts of um, beliefs and concerns remain in the agency, the next Farm Bill is likely, although it is a very, as I say, political document with Congress, to incorporate more aspects of this. And, and nothing's going to happen quickly because these, these only come out every five years or so. But I, I think we are likely moving in, in, the, in that direction, but perhaps not as quickly as most of us would like to see. All right. Thanks again, Thank David. You. Appreciate that. All right, for our next session here, we're going to get into a little bit more of a discussion on this. This is going to be a, uh, a, a facilitated dialogue here. We've got a, a little presentation to start it out with. First, though, I did want to thank Brent Truskowski for organizing this overall session. Thank you, Brent. Uh, this is kind of one of those things that's uh, been, you know, appeared on the radar a few years ago and is starting to loom larger and larger. So what we've got for... And Rick, oh, that's right, Rick, I forgot. You've retired, Rick, and you're completely off the radar screen now, but thank you to Rick. And he is also here on his own dime, I guess, <laughs> so above and beyond once again. Uh, but we've got a, a, a short uh, opening session here from Steve Epting for a little bit of context on what we're going to talk about here. We want to hear from you on what you've been doing uh, in your states, territories, and tribes. And Steve's going to kick us off here, and then we'll get into the, the meat of it. So I'll be very brief, but just set some context for this discussion. Um, as Barry mentioned, we've been having some, some chats the last few months um, leading up to this session at the meeting, thinking about uh, our own 319 program and, and our non-point source work and what we can do to take a closer look at the national program at incorporating climate change into the work that we do. And so kind of teeing off from the information that Jeff provided at a broader uh, EPA and, and kind of federal partner uh, perspective, um, each of the different programs at EPA or a few of them over the past year or two have, including the revolving funds, have taken a look at their program, their program uh, plans and, and kind of guiding documents, as well as the work that's happening on the ground to see um, how we might better integrate climate change into each of these programs. So, uh, so we're up. Um, and what we're hoping is that this will be an initial discussion to tee off what will be in the coming months um, a, a, a 319 climate change work group. And so just to kind of set that context for what that group will be focusing on is really one is just evaluating the best practices that you all are currently doing in incorporating climate change planning into the work that you're doing. Um, and that can be kind of at a very broad scale in terms of the program plans, the five-year strategies that are guiding the work, your prioritization from, for where you're working, uh, down to BMP design. Um, and then with that, a, a second goal would be considering opportunities as a national program uh, to integrate climate change planning into our planning and implementation. Uh, so, you know, I, I mentioned kind of the scale of focus here from program plans to watershed-based planning all the way down to sizing of culverts. And there's a lot of different kind of intersection points at which climate change can be integrated into our program. But I think the first step is really just looking at the language that we're using as a national program. Um, it, the first question really is, are you talking about climate change in your non-point source programs? Is it something that you're acknowledging uh, in your program plans? Um, are you looped into uh, any any interagency kind of state groups that are, uh, I know some states have climate change working groups, are, are your non-point source staff part of those discussions? Um, so one other thing I'll say with my, my tribal 319 coordinator hat on is um, I think the tribal community is, is probably one area we can look to for kind of best practices or models. Um, tribal lands are kind of at the forefront of, of seeing some effects of climate change, and I know there's a lot of work through the Bureau of Indian Affairs to integrate climate change adaptation planning um, in tribal programs. So I'd love to hear from our tribal representatives here today on what you're doing, if anything. Um, and, uh, and then I'll just kind of segue into our next session here, or next part of the session, which is one of the first steps we've taken at, at EPA headquarters is taking a look at your updated non-point source program plans to kind of answer that first question of, 
um, how many of you are at least talking or mentioning climate change or kind of uh, climate change vulnerabilities specific to your geographic region. So one of our folks in-house, Ari Engelberg, um, did a first step of just looking at really a, a basic keyword search of where climate change was mentioned among the state program plans. And so we have a couple folks uh, from states that kind of rose to the top in terms of um, per capita kind of mentions of climate change or um, climate change vulnerabilities specific to, to their parts of the country. So you know, this really is an initial screen. It doesn't mean that if you mention climate change that you're, you're doing meaningful work. Um, it may be more likely, but uh, we're going to have Robert Ray uh, from Montana just give us a really quick snapshot um, since Montana was one of the states that um, we saw talking a lot about climate change of uh, kind of what he's been working on the last few years and, and how even taking that first step of, of writing the words climate change in a document came to be, which, which really is kind of a first actionable step. Thanks, Steve. And I was really surprised when I heard that Montana is only one of two states that actually had some section in their plan that addressed climate change. So um, Governor Schweitzer in 2005 started um, a, um, a group. It was called the uh, Governor's Climate Change Advisory Committee, and they came out with a final report, Montana Climate Change Action Plan in 2007. And I was at the Western Governors Association meeting in 2007 in Salt Lake, and um, I thought it was a really interesting conversation that took a better part of a day talking about um, climate change and what local governments as well as state governments could do to address uh, potential changes to infrastructure specifically as a result of changes in uh, climate. And uh, with that discussion, I thought, well, gee, that's something that we all have in our plan, too, because certainly drought, floods, water quality in general, temperature, all these things are going to be significantly impacted by um, what's being seen uh, and forecast for changes in our climate. So um, with our 2012 non-point source management plan, we added a section on climate change. It's under strategies for other pollution sources and it's called Climate Change Contributions, and it's only a page or so in length. But we did identify some objectives for climate change, and I'll just uh, quickly go through a few of them. Uh, identify water bodies and aquatic organisms most susceptible to climate change, including flow and temperature regimes, support temperature and flow monitoring efforts in Montana watersheds, protect and restore cold water ref refuges, including deep pool habitat and cool spring groundwater return flows to rivers and streams, protect and restore riparian areas with native vegetation, which provides shades and stabilizes banks. So those are just some of the examples that we have in our plan. And I'm um, happy to say that we've been implementing those kinds of practices um, with our um, 319 funds. Um, some of those things have included uh, other state agencies. For example, um, in 2015, the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation put together, uh, updated our Montana State Water Plan, which is basically um, a focus on water quantity. And um, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly enough, uh, as the DNRC went around the state to develop this statewide plan, in each of the basins that they spoke there was a lot of conversation about water quality as a part of being water quantity planting as planning as well. And so um, with the state, state plan, now they're going back to the basin plan to develop implementation practices, and we're working with DNRC on the basin plans that include um, important considerations like in-stream flow issues, um, floodplain access, and so on. Uh, but getting down to the 319 project level, we also have been um, promoting and um, uh, actually supporting through um, project um, funding, floodplain access, projects to improve uh, habitats and flow for cold water fisheries, uh, the grayling, alluvial arctic grayling in the big hole, and um, the bull trout in western waters um, of the state. Habitat connectivity that we saw talked about earlier by Jeff, um, water temperature protection and, and improvement 
uh, with stream shading um, has been um, some of the practices that we have paid for with 319 funds. Steve also asked me to talk about um, when we were going through our plan update, did we have any um, pushback? And I would say that the, there was only one comment, and it was by the Western Environmental Trades Alliance in Montana, and they basically said, why are you talking about climate change? And our response was, because we think that there is something that we can do uh, to promote, protect, and um, improve water quality in the, in the face of what we see as climate change. And um, that was basically the extent of the concern that we heard as we were developing our plan. All right. And we're also going to hear from Jane Pierce of Massachusetts. Hi, so uh, we are another state that had uh, climate change show up in our non-point source management plan quite a few times. And for us, <clears throat> I think, I think we, are, we are not climate change deniers in this state anyway. I think it's pretty much part of the vernacular that we all use when we talk about what's going on. We've had extraordinarily um, severe drought this year, and uh, we had some really bad storms in a few past years. It blew up a few of our western watersheds. So we're, we're pretty much aware already that we need to deal with climate change. And so we took the opportunity in the Nonpoint Source Management Plan to reinforce the idea that we've had in our 319 solicitation now for several years, and that is if you're going to design a best management practice and propose it to us and use public funds to build it, use current climate data. Don't be giving us designs based on you know, 1960s TR55 data so that everything we build today is already needs to be retrofitted before we even build it. We're in a, we're in a world here where we, we can't retrofit as fast as we build bad things. So we are trying real hard. <laughs> we're trying real hard to just get ahead of that or at least, at least make sure that what we build, what we build with public money in this program is going to be useful going forward. So we used some of our money. Our, our uh, non-point source management plan incorporates the 6217 Cesara plan. You heard me speak yesterday about how closely we try to partner with our other agencies. We worked with our um, coastal zone management partners to do a study on coastal best management practices that had already been installed to make sure that um, we understand what happens when sea level rise and storm surge hits these things. If, you know, if the thing has a 20-year life, let's make sure we have an idea where the groundwater level is going to be in 20 years because infiltration doesn't work that well if it's already underwater. So um, we've just tried to sort of embed that kind of thinking in our, in our uh, non-point source managed plan everywhere and in the designs that we select when we do projects. And, um, we have, uh, it has been received very well and it pretty much works for us because our audience is used to us asking for that now. So thanks. All right, so hopefully that got the wheels turning. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Jane and Robert, that was great. This is Linda. I just wanted to do a quick clarification on, on Ari's look at the non resource management programs. There weren't just two states that mentioned climate. A, a lot of states mentioned climate, but Massachusetts and Montana uh, mentioned it more, and that's what led us to ask them to talk. They started at the M states, and they found those two, and then they... Yeah. All right, so now we're just going to do a little quick poll. Uh, we're interested in how many of you had a, have attended some kind of professional training on climate change impacts to water resources, workshops, seminars. How many have attended some kind of professional training, some kind of formal training on climate change impacts to water resources? Raise your hands really high. All right, now keep your hands high, except all the EPA people put your hands down. Let's just see the state, territory, and tribal people who have had it. So a pretty good smattering out there, uh, maybe a fourth it looks like. Uh, and we have another quick poll question here for you as well. This one's a little bit harder. Uh, you'll have to think a little bit about this one. Within your state, territory, or tribe, to what extent is there political recognition and acknowledgement? of climate change. Now, we don't want any EPA people to 
to vote on this. We want just state, tribal, and territorial people. And this is on a one to five scale with one being no recognition whatsoever and then five being full recognition and acknowledgement of climate change and the impact associated with climate change. So among the state, tribal, and territorial people, how many would say uh, in your state is probably a number one, no recognition whatsoever? Okay, hands down. Now on the two scale, maybe a little bit of uh, acknowledgement. Not much, but maybe a passing reference here or there. All right, so, okay, and put your hands down. Number three, somewhere in the middle. All right, and then maybe a little bit more than average recognition and acknowledgement of climate change. Maybe a number four in terms of acknowledgement. And how about full recognition and acknowledgement? Wow. Uh, not quite a bell curve, pretty flat all the way through it looked like uh, on the responses for that. Uh, now we want to get into a little bit before we break here of what you're doing out there in terms of, of uh, your program management, your program planning and, and climate change. For non-point programs that have begun considering climate change in your work, what actions have you taken? What has proven particularly successful or particularly challenging? And we'll just open up the floor. What are you doing? What's working good? What's challenging? Hi, my name is uh, Lisa Hare at uh, EPA uh, headquarters. And one of the things that we've been doing that we think that at headquarters that we think has been pretty successful is um, is working with uh, uh, with with FEMA. Um, one of the uh, things that uh, that you might want to consider integrating with when you do your nonpoint source plan is to look at your um, state and local um, hazard mitigation plans as opportunities for integration. There are a lot of people here who have been uh, integrating plans with, say, source water protection. But uh, take a look at, the, at your community's um, hazard mitigation plan. Um, FEMA does require that uh, those hazard mitigation plans now uh, consider uh, climate change, and they are all about, not all about, but a big part is about flooding and water management. They want to fund green infrastructure uh, type projects of all kinds, um, and they have a lot of money, and um, they uh, uh, are very willing to work, work with EPA. Most of the regions, or at least many of the regions, uh, have good working relationships uh, with, with FEMA. And uh, when you put together, when your community is putting together a local hazard mitigation plan, uh, find out who they are, work with them, let them know that you've got the nonpoint source management plan. I think uh, Region 7 is, uh, is already doing this. So they have, uh, they have funding for all different types of projects. And um, also perhaps working with uh, the Corps of Engineers when you work with the Corps. They're not allowed to talk about water quality, but they can talk about habitat and work together. So that can help with some of your overall program integration with the nonpoint source, and uh, to work with uh, all federal agencies together on water management plans. Uh, consider joining your um, um, state um, Silver Jackets uh, team. That's a Corps of Engineers sponsored um, sort of a round, round table of um, all the federal agencies reporting to the state hazard mitigation officer. While they focus a lot on flood risk management. You know, it is water management, and you're going to have all the different federal agencies uh, at the table, uh, USDA, FEMA, and the Corps, all looking at uh, water management planning. So if you have any questions on that, um, let me know. Uh, thanks. Bye. Okay, Brandon, yeah, real, real quick, I want, to, I want to just kind of expand the, the question just a little bit. Not only what are you doing, but you know, one of the, the charters of the work group is how can we help? So, you know, the, the same old question, you know, we're with the federal government, we're here to help. But how, how can, what can we do as a federal program to help the state implement climate change planning in the nonpoint source program? All right, go ahead. So, uh, Oklahoma is Jim Inhofe State. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so we, uh, we operate in an environment of, of folks who don't want to talk about or acknowledge climate change. Um, but nonetheless, we found a way to work with people um, who are uh, and to address those challenges, and we tend to talk about preparing people for extreme weather events, um, such as um, preparing for drought or um, heavy um, rainfall events. 
And through the process, we um, partnered with an electric cooperative as kind of an add-on to a 319 project, um, and we were able to enroll 50,000 acres into climate carbon contracts across the state, um, and through the process, took about six to 8,000 cars off the road per year um, in carbon that was sequestered in the soil. We also developed a process um, where we trained folks across the state to do verification of whether or not the practices that were being implemented were actually implemented in a way that they not only protect water quality but also did um, sequester carbon in soil. Um, and then as we've also taken advantage now of the opportunities through the NRCS Soil Health Education Program to further um, continue that development. And so um, at, just a quick plug, um, there's an Oklahoma Soil Health um, Facebook group that's made up of um, participants and proponents of soil health who are ag producers who are really um, sharing information, sharing research between themselves through this process, they are the ones who are demonstrating um, ways that our, our communities can be better um, equipped to handle climate change, but also um, hopefully um, address and reduce um, the extent that climate change will happen in Oklahoma. And um, they're, they're a much better um, voice for that than the, the state and federal government officials are. Um, so we're, we're looking to them to be the leaders, and um, we're using our 319 program to provide them with um, some opportunities to help them um, extend those that, that training. Before we hear from other states, tribes, and territories, let me just ask another quick poll question. How many states, tribes, and territories have considered climate change in a meaningful way in their five-year plans or other program uh, planning or implementation documents. Raise your hands really high here. I think there's some interest in that. So just a smattering have done it in a meaningful, some kind of meaningful way. Okay, others may have mentioned it, you know, and kind of got their toe in the door a little bit. Any other state, tribal, and territory examples of things that have been done? Uh, so I'm Josh from Oregon. We have a drinking water protection program that has a non-point source component with it that I work closely with um, and was a part of until recently. Uh, it's, we've been working with utilities, drinking water systems, particularly on the coastal part of Oregon that's becoming increasingly vulnerable to large storms. Like we've had two 100-year storm events in the last 10 years, which you know really begs the definition of a 100-year storm. Um, but you know, a lot of steep slopes, a lot of really erodible soils, and so we've been working with the water systems to map out where vulnerable parts of their watersheds are, where are you going to see shallow landslides, where are you going to see, you know, a lot of soil erosion, and then working with them to identify, um, you know, land management, really going to the protect the source approach and using the Clean Water Act and non-point source program to let's identify places and protect them if they're vulnerable. Um, and then kind of work to provide them with financial or um, land management tools to, to protect those vulnerable locations. Good. Other examples from the states, tribes, and territories? Cindy Gilder in Alaska, which I guess I can say POTUS came up and said we're ground zero for climate change. Um, there's a couple of things that sort of come to the top of my head that the 319 program is working on. On a every six months basis, there's an interagency hydrology group committee where we talk about various state and federal agencies and what they're doing. It's places where fish and wildlife is really taking a lead role in temperature monitoring. So it's trying to get all the temperature data that's collected across all of Alaska's streams in one framework. So there's a host of information sharing that goes on. Um, the other thing that actually EPA is helping us with is getting to better maps. Um, just as an example, one of the county, one of what people would call a county in Alaska has done some enhanced mapping, and as a result of the increased mapping, we've doubled the number of stream miles. So knowing what we've got is going to be important in terms of climate change, which we don't know right now. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Craig. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. Craig Creamy with the Quapaw Tribe of Oklahoma. Uh, one of nine tribes in a very small county in northeast Oklahoma uh, was able to actually work with um, BIA, Department of Interior, and the South Central Climate Science Center to put on a, non or a, um, a climate change 101 for the tribes up in that area, which was a very good um, uh, training for those tribes um, regionally to look at some of those climate issues. That was a, a, a highlight we wanted to point out. What's that? Uh, Northeast Oklahoma. Yep. Yes. All right, so uh, Ben Rao, and I'm from Washington State. Um, wanted to point out, uh, in most of this, we're coming at it strictly from uh, the standpoint of trying to meet the, the temperature standards, but related to, to climate change. Four years ago, and this is really based off of uh, some of the tribes, uh, their tri uh, treaty rights at risk effort in Washington State, um, we uh, changed our funding guidelines so that we um, will only fund buffers that are designed to actually meet the, the, the temperature standards. So we bumped up uh, the minimums for buffers on the, the west side of the state to 100 feet on um, basically salmon bearing waters, uh, 50 feet on just perennial and the 35 on intermittent streams. Uh, east side, it's the, the same except for it's 75 on the, the fish bearing waters. Um, just as a note on that, uh, we, we have been able to spend the money, but it's really difficult, and I think especially when we're thinking about you know, different approaches to addressing climate change and, and as it relates to the temperature, I think a lot of these things become really difficult and difficult to sell, especially in just an incentive-based program. Um, I'll point out kind of two other things. So uh, we've been working with uh, uh, PNDSA, which is Pacific Northwest Direct Seed Association, on um, the no-till um, I mean, how we can promote that. Again, we came at that from a water quality perspective, sediment, nutrients, um, trying to control that. But we're now looking at ways to sell that program based on some of the climate change stuff. And then finally, uh, we have a Team DL that's in draft form right now. It's a NUXEC Team DL, which will have a climate change component to it. So that'll be coming out. Uh, well, there's hiccups there, so I don't know when it'll be coming out, but it should be coming out in the next year or so. Um, this, I'm Abe Franklin from New Mexico, and we don't have in any of our program information any mention of climate change that I'm aware of, but we do have about somewhere around half of our impaired streams are listed for temperature, and the majority of those have TMDLs for temperature and a large share of our 319 work is related to addressing that. And Jeff's presentation mentioned that there were 46 projects and grits that address temperature, and I think we probably have half of them. Um, and so typically the, TM, the TMDLs use a model called SS Temp that looks at the current canopy coverage and sets a goal for canopy increase. So a lot of our projects sort of focus on getting that canopy increase, and it's mostly through livestock exclusion. And uh, some of that is through um, also through elk ex exclosures, which are like livestock fences, but eight feet tall. And um, yeah, so we've got, uh, we're not explicitly addressing climate change, but we are sort of temperature focused and thinking about it maybe for next time around that we revise the non-point source management plan. Yeah, definitely a lot of uh, lead through there from existing non-point source priorities. Uh, another quick question before we break, and Steve wraps this up. What kind of information would be most useful to the states, tribes, and territories, uh, whether it's technical program guidance, examples, you know, webinars? What do states, tribes, and territories need to sort of move this forward into your programs? Uh, and that can be, you know, addressing any obstacles or challenges you might face. Uh, but there's there's a great interest in that. I'm going to take a different angle in, in responding to that question. That is, you know, what we need if if we want to have the non-point source program address consider climate change 
And this is going to be counterintuitive because, you know, we just got scolded back in 2012-13 by OMB and Congress over the way the program is run, but we need to go back to having, allowing the states more flexibility because the, the new sets of rules and guidelines that have put, have essentially put handcuffs on us on a lot of this. They've put us in a position where it's difficult for us to get approval to do the things that go beyond a very uh, narrowly focused um, uh, attempt to address the impaired waters that we have in our states. So flexibility has always been the hallmark of the, of the non-point program. And with the new rules, it's really kind of going counter and counterintuitive to what, what's being talked about right now in this session, which is to adapt the 319 program to address climate change. So I would offer and beg EPA to find a way to work with OMB to allow us the flexibility we used to have. All right, thanks, Alan. Here's Ben here for another suggestion. I think what, what I would look for is affecting this information on BMPs and doing, you know, it, its effectiveness. Should we be looking at that differently because of the climate change issue? So, you know, our, you know, what comes to mind for me, or should we be designing the BMPs differently based on uh, climate change or what we can expect? You know, are the buffer sizes that we should be getting on the ground? those be bigger? Should we focus more on, I heard cold water or fuchsia, we've been talking about that as well in Washington State. You know, are there, are there different ways to prioritize? But really, the effectiveness of BMPs and, you know, do, do we need to look at that differently based on climate change? Other suggestions? Uh, <clears throat> I think um, Alan from Iowa hit on something that was pretty important. And then the gentleman from USDA got another angle on it, which is sort of the the cultural and economic system we're operating within. And I don't know if that's something that, you know, EPA or USDA at the national level can help us with, but, you know, we need to really, I think, shift the culture around how we view and operate in ecosystems. Um, a lot of what we're doing is in a small way trying to restore and rebuild resiliency in natural systems. Um, and. You know, I think a, a, something that we really kind of need to start doing is changing how the general public and how land managers think about ecosystems and, and um, you know, really work towards rebuilding the capacity of those systems in a way that doesn't completely disrupt human society. I know for tribes, uh, we tend to have a higher turnover than probably states. Uh, it would be nice if there was uh, management practice uh, or management plan trainings once in a while, or even if those could be videoed and put in like a, a 101 YouTube. That way it's always there to be able to be pulled up to something as a reference for the new people. Because in our tribal meeting yesterday, on average, people tend in the program tend to be here less than two years. And so it throws a huge learning curve when you're starting out. Peter. Well, maybe uh, if there is another non-point source monitoring workshop, climate change could be part of the theme there for the effectiveness, getting back to Ben's uh, comment there. I'll just say for uh, Northern California, one of the big climate change challenges from my perspective is the program person at EPA is how we handle issues of flow versus water quality and is the Clean Water Act, can we address flow, how do we deal with water rights that are impacted by projects that address flow that support refugia and other things. So clarifying how EPA wants to handle that would be really helpful. All right, we're a little past our break. I apologize, but we really wanted to have this discussion and get this input from yeah, thanks, Barry. So I'll just say, uh, you know, thanks for the initial feedback and in terms of kind of next steps. So we, we at EPA have, have identified a couple um, folks in-house who will be kind of chairing this work group. So Brent Truskowski out in Region 8. Um, we have a, a staff person in Region 3, Re Regina Poeski, who kind of sits outside 319, but will give us, give us a broader perspective on uh, climate work across different water programs. So. I think I'm next up for a presentation, so my email will be up there. Um, I'll just encourage you to, to find Brent or myself during the break, and, and if you have any specific input, or really just um, you know stand by for opportunities moving forward in the next few months for feedback on um, 
kind of recommendations from that work group. One quick announcement, then we'll have our break. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that really wonderful discussion. Before I make a quick announcement, in Region 1, we did have all our uh, states try to incorporate climate change into their upgrades, their management plan upgrades, some more meaningfully than others, but it's good to start this dialogue going. Um, but just uh, before a quick announcement, has this been fun or what? Oh, my gosh. We even have the Cubs winning the World Series. How do we manage that? Cra crazy stuff. So condolences to the Cleveland fans, but next year will be your turn. We'll be rooting for you if we're not rooting for the Red Sox. But, uh, and I hate to sound like a Ginsu knife commercial here, but wait, there's more. If anyone's interested in joining me for a tour of Copley Square before you fly off, um, we'll be going to Trinity Church, um, the old wing of the Boston Public Library, which is lovely. Lots of beautiful artwork and architecture, and it's free. And uh, we'll be leaving here after the meeting adjourns, obviously. And there's a sign-up sheet at the registration table if you're interested. Might want to bring an umbrella. I'm not sure about the rain, but it is kind of warm out there today. So hope you can join me, and what a pleasure it's been to have you here. Thank you. Yes, very good. Take a break. We'll see you back at 1030. Don't forget to fill out your evaluation forms and leave them at the registration table. Hi, everybody. My name is Julian. I'm one of the staff people at Aqua. A lot of you are probably familiar with the Association of Clean Water Administrators, or Aqua, formerly ASWIPCA, and um, we represent um, all 50 state clean water programs and their administrators, and our members consist of the administrators and a lot of their staff. And uh, I just wanted to let everybody know if they didn't already know that we, one of the things we have is a non-point source work group, which uh, meets basically every other month uh, by phone, webinar, conference, and we have presentations from EPA, from states, um, and it's a good forum to see what other states are doing in the non-point source world, to get together with other states and discuss any new policy from EPA, and it's also a platform for EPA to get feedback from states on non-point issues that uh, they're taking on. And if you're not on our email roster already and would like to be, just come find me um, after after the uh, everything is done here today, I'll be hanging out. Or my email is should be in the um, the roster that shows everybody who is at the meeting. Just look for Julian Gonzalez. Thanks. All right, we uh, we've talked about the bad and the ugly for the last few days. We saved the good waters for last. This session focuses on healthy watersheds and protecting unimpaired waters. You're going to hear about implementation of watershed protection projects from around the country and discuss. Public understanding and protection for and protection for protection programs and challenges. This session will highlight alternative watershed-based plans for lake protection, such as in Maine, as well as provide examples of how states have used assessment information and prior, to prioritize and leverage resources. You also learn about one of the six completed integrated assessments, and headquarters will give an overview of their National Preliminary Healthy Watersheds Assessment for the lower 48 states, and you have an opportunity to provide feedback. Kicking off this session will be Steve Epting to talk about an overview of EPA's Preliminary Healthy Watersheds Assessment for the lower 48. Great. Thanks, Barry. Hello again. Uh, so I shape-shifted, put on my third hat. Um, I'm the Tribal 319 Coordinator, also part of the Healthy Watersheds Program. Just by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the Healthy Watersheds Program? Okay, great. So this will be a reintroduction to the program. Um, I know that the program has been well integrated into 319 before. We've had some recent changes in recent years and kind of um, some exciting new opportunities and uh, both funding-wise and, and, and in the resources that we're providing uh, to states, tribes, and territories. So I'll kind of give you a, a reintroduction to the program this morning. And so I'll, I'll give you just a little bit of brief context in the beginning of this presentation for the program history, uh, kind of where we were dating back to 2009 when the program began, and where we are today. Uh, some things have shifted a little bit. Our overall goals are very much aligned with where we were, but we're really thinking about um, kind of application to, to a broader national audience, and so that's kind of shifted some of the areas that we're working in. And then I'll kind of give you with that what our, our kind of updated goals are as a Healthy Watersheds program, and then give you a snapshot of some of the big projects that we're working on this coming year. 
I, I wanted to start, though, by just defining healthy watersheds. I was talking a bit to Todd Janeski before we started uh, from Virginia, and we were talking about, you know, there are many different ways that in which healthy waters or healthy watersheds are defined. Um, you know, long story short, watersheds are, are really complex uh, systems that, that we think about in terms of kind of structure and patterns of land use and, and drainage networks through those land landscapes, and then the processes that are functioning on a, a landscape scale uh, within waterways. So this is a very complex picture that um, is just meant to overwhelm you. Uh, <laughs> so, so the question of what is healthy, um, you know, we're finding that across states and, and tribes and territories, they're, they're defined in many different ways. Um, some, some states have looked to water quality standards in terms of those tier two and tier three waters, the outstanding national resource waters um, to define you know, what's their, what are their priorities for uh, protection efforts. Uh, others have looked to cases where there are assessed but unimpaired waters for, for all parameters where waterways are, are meeting all designated uses and kind of defining those waterways as, as high quality or, or again priorities for protection. States like Virginia ha have been um, kind of aggregating up biological data and, and, and in-stream data to, to develop probabilistic modeling um, to predict condition in, in waterways that have not been surveyed. Other big federal programs like the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Program have kind of turned to designation of, of waterways as a, a way of kind of deeming some waterways as high quality for protection. In this case, Wild and Scenic Rivers refers to, um, they kind of look at the overall condition of a watershed in terms of its development or natural land use. Um, they're a program that's kind of focused on free-flowing waterways where, where dams have not been constructed. Um, so, you know, designation of something as healthy is certainly one of the drivers in what's prioritizing, you know, where protection efforts are going in. And then lastly, we're seeing some states uh, similar to EPA's Healthy Watersheds Program which are using what we refer to as, as multi-metric indices or approaches where we're taking a number of different indicators at a watershed scale and rolling that all up into um, a single value with which to, to rank or prioritize watersheds in terms of their relative health or vulnerability. So there's no one answer. Um, I think it's just helpful to, to know that there are a lot of different ways um, with which groups and, and, and agencies are, are uh, labeling waterways uh, as healthy. So again, within the Healthy Watersheds Program at EPA, uh, we really take a systems approach. So I know it's been mentioned a few times this week about um, kind of the challenges of managing ecosystems from a parameter by parameter um, uh, approach. And, um, and so we think about uh, watersheds as systems again that um, are, are complicated features that, in, in, that are dependent on the health of, of structure and, and pattern of the landscape, as well as processes that are occurring in terrestrial um, areas upstream of waterways, as well as within, in, within waterways. And we've kind of encapsulated these, these features of the watersheds into three main areas. Uh, one is natural land cover. Um, th this is certainly important when it comes to kind of the, the infiltration of water, uh, getting to, to streams and, and the delays that are important in, in watersheds where wetlands play a key role in slowing down the water that before it reaches waterways. Uh, habitat, both within waterways but also um, on terrestrial lands. Um, healthy waters can provide a good corridors for migrating species. And then we really look to water quality, uh, both the assessment information that states are providing as well as um, uh, models that, that predict uh, can water quality condition in, in unsurveyed waters to tie that into an overall measure of watershed health. So I'm going to revisit kind of this, this idea of, of assessing watersheds for the relative watershed health in a minute, but I did just want to catch us all up into kind of how the program came to be and, and where we're at today. So the Healthy Watersheds Program at EPA was established in two, 2009 really to address an under underappreciated or, or, or maybe overlooked um, part of the Clean Water Act goal, which was to not only restore water, waters, but maintain their health in, in cases where they're already high, quali high quality and unimpaired. So in, in the first few years of the program, 
Um, we had a very ambitious uh, lead, Laura Gabanski, many of you probably worked with. And Laura and the team really worked to develop relationships within EPA offices, uh, with, with some states, with nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy, uh, to kind of develop a, a programmatic foundation for our program, uh, both in terms of um, how we're defining or, or identifying healthy watersheds, uh, and then what management actions are we as EPA recommending um, for, for states or tribes or territories interested in, in doing protection in those identified healthy watersheds. And so I, I just noted one of those documents that's kind of a foundational piece even today is um, uh, identifying and protecting healthy watersheds. This is kind of the, the overall uh, manual for kind of the guiding concepts, the, the science that goes into the healthy watersheds program, uh, our assessment approach, and, and again, management approaches on the ground. So in the first, I'd say five or six years of the program, we were really focused on partnering with individual states to conduct what we call healthy watersheds integrated assessments. And overall, we partnered with, uh, to do about uh, eight assessments, including four statewide assessments. You see the states listed here. Um, and we realized that at this rate, it would take us about 50 years to get to all the states. Um, and so we've now thought about how can we more efficiently provide resources as a healthy watersheds program to all, all states. And I'll talk a bit about that in the coming year, some work we have going on. So the, the last bullet is, you know, as there's been a growing emphasis in protection at EPA, as well as uh, limited resources, uh, we've had a busy few years uh, in terms of um, staff changes. We've been kind of forced, but also have, have taken the opportunity to look at our program, our healthy watersheds program, and, and think about kind of priority, priorities moving forward uh, and so I'll talk a bit about that and what we have going on for the coming year. So just in terms of our, our overall program goals, and again, these look pretty close to what we, where we were a few years ago, but with some important changes. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time kind of walking through all of these, but I'll be hitting on all of these goals and kind of our upcoming year's uh, priorities. But just want, just want to make the point that we really view our role as a healthy watersheds program as kind of being that really important link between the Clean Water Act programs and the aquatic community and the broader protection community that might include uh, landscape conservation cooperatives and more terrestrial focused conservation groups. So uh, the, the biggest thing I wanted to, to make you all aware of today is uh, what we're really excited about this coming year, which we're calling our preliminary healthy watersheds assessment. So I, I mentioned that we'd focus primarily with individual states that doing really in-depth, kind of robust uh, assessments of watershed health and vulnerability. Uh, to date, we've, we've completed four of those. So those were at the, the NHD, the National Hydrography Dataset uh, Catchment Scale, so really small spatial scale, about one to two square miles were kind of the spatial units that we were assessing in, in, in those assessments. And uh, where we've kind of landed and where we're focusing moving forward is um, developing a product that we think will be kind of a, a great baseline characterization for states across the lower 48. I'm looking at Cindy right now. Uh, Alaska is obviously not, not on here. Uh, let's chat afterwards. Um, but the, the goal here really is thinking about using nationally available data sets um, to characterize HUC-12 watershed health and vulnerability um, across the lower 48. So th there, that's a really important jump. and, and um, you know, has some limitations in terms of uh, the spatial resolution that we're, with which we're working and the data sets that we have on hand. In those past statewide assessments, um, we really partnered with the states to find um, state-specific, uh, oftentimes geospatial layers that we could really um, kind of uh, characterize or, or um, kind of uh, shift to the state's needs. Uh, here, we're using a common set of indicators across the lower 48. Um, again, we're, we're continuing the framework of, of assessing both watershed health as well as vulnerability because um, projected changes in land use and, and water use and climate change is certainly important to thinking about um, the high quality of watersheds today and the condition moving forward. And then another big component of this preliminary healthy watersheds assessment will be not only assessing relative watershed health and vulnerability at a statewide scale, but also thinking more broadly at an ecoregional scale. And this is a really important addition to the assessment approach that we've added this time around where 
um, essentially each HUC12 will receive two scores. One is how that HUC12 relates to or compares to other watersheds across the state in health and vulnerability. And then a second score, which is how it compares to other watersheds across its ecoregion. And we think that pairing that information together is really kind of a new way that might inform some regional dialogue in terms of cases where a watershed may not rank high at a statewide level, but in thinking about more ecologically appropriate boundaries, um, it may be a really important resource across its ecoregion. And that piece of information is something that we, we'd like the states and, and tribes and territories to have. So just for those of you not familiar with, with ecoregions, uh, these are, are areas that are characterized by their physiography, uh, geology, uh, water quality, um, and, and kind of physical characteristics. Um, we're using EPA level three ecoregions, of which there's 105 nationally. So most of these ecoregions span multiple states, and so with that pairwise scoring, you're getting a sense again of where your watershed compares statewide and then also across these broader ecological regions. We're using the same overall assessment framework that we've used in those past statewide integrated assessments. Um, we're referring to a, a EPA Science Advisory Board uh, report from 2002 that kind of outlined um, an approach for thinking about ecological health and breaking that down into six main components you see on the left there. And then we've been um, uh, looking at, at looking for nationally available data sets that can give us a, a sense of um, projected vulnerabilities in a watershed. Um, I'll mention that this is a, a more challenging piece of the assessment approach, projecting future conditions. And so in some cases, we had to use kind of surrogates, for example, um, USGS county estimates of current water use as a proxy for future water use. So uh, an area that we're hoping to build out in the future, but we have a first crack here with kind of these big three main areas of watershed vulnerability. So in terms of what this will look like for you all, um, we've been piloting with, with the state of Colorado over the last few months to get some feedback on the assessment approach and, and uh, data outputs. And so what you hear, see here is the state of Colorado. It's probably hard to see, but those darker black lines running through the state are those EPA uh, level three ecoregion boundaries. And so what I'm showing here is just a percentile breakdown of, of watershed health scores across the state. And what we're hoping and, and thinking that this might provide then for, uh, for each state is really a chance to, for example, look at the, the top 25% scoring uh, water, uh, watersheds in terms of their health and to start to think about um, how, how this map might inform how you're targeting your, your 319 funds, for example, uh, for on the ground work, uh, in this case for protection. And, and so it kind of gives you a chance to look spatially at, at where are your, your healthiest watersheds um, looking at clusters of HUC-12s that might indicate um, a healthier basin, um, and also encourage you to think about uh, the relative health of watersheds in terms of the, the hydrography. So do you have really healthy watersheds that's downstream of, a, of a, a, a less healthy watershed that may be more vulnerable, and thinking about the impact of upstream and downstream connections uh, to watershed health. And then we're also in incorporating that vulnerability information. So again, here on the left, I'm showing that same top 25% um, by health index in Colorado. And then on the right, um, that same set of HUC-12s is, is colored, um, but this time by the relative watershed vulnerability, which is made up again of these three components, land use, water use, and, and wildfire vulnerability. And so what you begin to see is, is uh, kind of the different vulnerabilities across the state of Colorado. On the eastern portion, on the bottom left here, you see land use and water use are, are more of a more of a risk than um, than wildfire, which dominates the the, east, the western part of the state. And that might inform the types of treatments or um, fuel reduction or, or land use management that you're doing across the state. So we're still in kind of the 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 draft phases of, of deciding how the, these results will be provided to, to you all. But in addition to the maps, we're, we'll be providing, again, those raw data, data tables and encouraging you to, to use your own state data and, and augment the results here and kind of rerun the calculations if you have better geospatial layers statewide. And again, what you can begin to, begin to see, two watersheds in Colorado where on the far left, um, a percentile score for statewide watershed health, uh, these two watersheds, Williams Creek and Steel Hollow, 
don't rank particularly high at the statewide level, but they do at an eco-regional scale. So they may, that might be an important piece of information um, as managers at the statewide level. And again, just getting a sense of kind of the distribution of watershed scores eco-regionally. Um, I've highlighted the Southern Rockies eco-region in Colorado here, where this is a significantly higher number of watersheds that are in the top 25% of their eco-region than those that have been identified at the statewide scale. So again, these cases where in only looking within your state boundaries, you may be, you may be overlooking cases of really healthy watersheds that are important across their ecological regions. So I'm going to wrap up by just giving a couple other updates in terms of our priorities for the coming year. Um, I mentioned that we really view our Healthy Watersheds program as an important link between the broader protection community and, and you all in the Clean Water Act programs. Um, within the 319 program, uh, with the recent revisions to the grant guidelines, um, the e EPA does allow for a limited amount of that watershed project funding, that on-the-ground funding, um, to be used for protection purposes. And so we're in the process of taking a closer look at kind of where the program is at to date in terms of funding protection work. So um, we've looked at our, our grants database um, and found that 21 states uh, since 2014 have entered 65 protection projects. Um, it's looking like a lot of those tend to be, you know, similar to what you consider for restoration, but um, we want to get a finer point on kind of what you are all are, are thinking in terms of um, cases where you may be doing restoration work, but in a high quality watershed. Again, kind of the spatial scale of this work is really important. Um, restoration may still be a component of protection work in a high quality watershed. And then we begin, begun looking at some states that have uh, incorporated protection in watershed-based planning. Um, we'll hear uh, from, um, from Norm in a bit, uh, from Maine, about their work with lakes. And then we'll be, we'll be kind of putting a finer point on how might we uh, better measure the success of protection efforts in our program. Um, we've ob obviously been focused on restoration for a few decades. We have our WQ10 measure as a program, but you know, how might we better track our protection work? And then outside of our 319 program, again, we, we have staff at headquarters that are kind of um, seated in these different programs. So Doug Norton is now our Healthy Watersheds uh, coordinator at EPA headquarters. He sits in the TMDL branch, so he's kind of our, our connection point to the, the state TMDL vision strategies. And we know that a number of states have identified protection as a priority in those strategies. And we also have connection points to some different EPA programs. Um, we're, kind of targeting the, the source water and the wetlands folks in the coming year in terms of thinking about efficiencies and, and coordinating between our programs. And then I also, I also sit on our Chesapeake Bay Healthy Watersheds group and uh, just thinking about kind of scaling up best practices from these place-based groups uh, to the national audience. And then lastly, I mentioned that we kind of view our role as linking up to the broader protection community. We had a few folks in our team at the Land Trust Alliance national meeting um, this past weekend, and so between those different groups that are more conservation or more terrestrial focused by, um, by their histories, we want to provide kind of that aquatic perspective in that broader protection work. I'll wrap up. I know Barry is uh, uh, shunting me off pretty soon, but um, I, I want to just mention that this year we have the second year of, of the Healthy Watersheds Consortium grant, um, so this was a, a really big uh, investment from EPA of, um, of funds over the next six years in partnering with the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, a nonprofit based in South Carolina. Uh, we launched this um, again in, in fall of 2015 with the idea of funding protection work um, through a competition nationwide. And so these projects are um, you know, certainly small in scale in terms of monetary resources, but the idea is that we're hoping to seed some of our funding to leverage much bigger projects and, um, and uh, efforts at, at a, a larger Huck 8 or, or watershed scale. So in 2016, we funded nine projects. It was a pretty overwhelming process. We had 169 applications. Uh, that was the first year of the consortium grant. So it's a fairly competitive process. Um, we funded nine uh, last year. Uh, you see those watersheds that will be covered through those projects uh, in black here on this map. And then this year, uh, the RFP is posted, uh, so uh, proposals are due February 1st, uh, again up to $2 million available. This is a jump from last year. We're excited to announce that a new partner in the consortium grant, and um, 
who will be com committing funds uh, for this year is NRCS. Um, and, um, and so just to note that these projects must conclude by, um, by 2020. So they're, they can be one to multi-year projects that um, really, again, get at using these funds to leverage kind of uh, uh, programs or, or broader resources at a, at a larger uh, watershed or basin scale. So I know that's a lot of information. Um, feel free to reach out to, to me or, or Doug, our, our coordinator. Um, again, this is an exciting time for our program. We feel like kind of these new opportunities in terms of integrating our program into the broader protection community, but also providing resources more generally to the national audience um, will be a great chance to um, efficiently kind of get at integrating protection into our programs. Thanks. All right, thank you, Steve. You said the magic word when you talked about funding. Don't go too far. Any quick questions here? We've got time for a couple before we move on. Steve, is there any plans to explicitly include climate change considerations in the Healthy Watershed grants, RFPs? Oh, is that Brent? Yeah. Of course you did. <laughs> You're asking him to go to the other side of his brain now, okay. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, there is. So, uh, you know, that would I, I, we've thought about that in terms of, of watershed vulnerability. Um, I, I think where we're at is, is just don't feel at, at the point this year where we have data layers that we can incorporate into a, a national assessment uh, regarding climate change. We've done some communicating with our Office of Research and Development folks. Um, I, I think at this point it's a question of, you know, how do we – develop an indicator that's relevant in a HUC-12 scale that can really encapsulate the vulnerabilities of climate change. Um, you know, the projections in terms of mean annual increase in precipitation um, probably isn't robust enough to really be meaningful in terms of um, at a HUC-12 scale. Um, but there are some exciting uh, kind of ventures through an EPA-USGS partnership, um, which they're calling the, um, uh, the Hydro Futures Project, I think, which will be kind of pairing the NHD, National Hydrography Data Set Layer, uh, with climate projections to get a, an estimate of future flows um, uh, across the country uh, at scale at these hydrologic landscape units. So I, I think for this year, we didn't feel like we had the data layers that were appropriate, but um, in partnering with uh, Dwight Atkinson and our TMDL branch and some of that work with USGS, I think it will only be a few years before we get there. All right. Thanks again, Steve. Thanks. All right, we're going to move north now to Maine and hear from Wendy Garland on Maine's lake watershed protection plans, alternatives to nine element plan. Good morning. I am not Norm, but I am channeling Norm this morning. So he's listening back at home, at home in Maine right now. Yep. Okay. So I'm Wendy Garland. I work at Maine DEP out of our Portland office, which is just about two hours north of here. So yes, for those of you from other parts of the country, you are that far north. I know a lot of people were surprised, like, I'm, I'm that close to Maine? Oh my gosh. Um, anyways, I was asked to come and talk about Maine's Lake Watershed-Based Protection Plans. Um, I was guessing because it was probably that other states have been grappling with the need and, and requirement to do watershed-based planning in a climate of reduced funds. and that has definitely been confirmed in the last few days, hearing from other states that others are in that same boat. So I'm going to be talking about Maine's approach to watershed-based planning in our high-quality threatened lakes. And um, we've found that this approach has really removed a barrier to getting work done and continuing our strong tradition of doing protection work in our lake watersheds. My presentation is going to describe our approach to lake protection, first of all and then describe the template that we've uh, developed for doing alternative planning that fits into this approach. I'll share an example of a group that's used this approach recently and then tell, tell you what, what else is happening in our state along these lines. So first of all, this is a, the map of the state of Maine. Um, you can see from the blue that there's a lot of water. There's a lot of lakes, um, about 5,700 lakes across the state. And we're fortunate to have their they're really high-quality lakes as well. 
Um, about two years ago, I think, Lake and Reservoir Management did a study and looked at water clarity across the nation, and Maine ranked third in terms of water clarity, right behind uh, Montana and Alaska, and right after us were um, Vermont and New Hampshire. So we have very high quality lakes, and um, so with so many high quality lakes, protection is a big part of what we do in Maine. Um, and we found, of course, as you all know, that protection is a lot easier and more cost effective than restoring impaired water. So it's in our interest to keep them clean. And um, so here's a map. You can see the little red dots. That's our impaired lakes. There's only 21 of them across the state. Um, a very small area in terms of lake acreage as well. About 12 of, I think 12 of them have um, nine element plans developed and they're over the years have been working towards restoring water quality in those areas. Many more are considered threatened by non-point source pollution and when I say threatened, it's not the terminology that you might use in terms of water quality standards or listing. We hope and do not expect that these would be listed as impaired in the next year or two, but they're more generally threatened by non-point sources. And so 151 of these lakes are on our priority watersheds list as our threatened list. And those are the lakes that we think are at higher risk of um, impairment due to non-point source pollution. And those are the lakes that are eligible for 319 funding. So um, what are the non-point sources facing our lakes? Um, luckily, it's, sort of a, it's pretty well understood and straightforward issue in Maine. Um, we've done studies, and many of you have met, met Jeff Dennis over the last few days at the conference. Well, back in the 80s, him and some other colleagues did research and looked at the runoff coming off of developed areas, a low residential subdivision compared to forested areas. And no big surprise, there was a lot more runoff coming off the developed areas and a lot more phosphorus in those watersheds. Um, so it was about five to ten times the amount of phosphorus coming off developed areas. So phosphorus is our nutrient of concern in Maine Lakes, and the avenue for that to reach the delivery mechanism is from soil erosion. Um, and here's a picture of a, a standard camp road. Um, that, so soil erosion from our camp roads and the developed properties around our lakes are, is the land use of concern. When we do our um, work in these watersheds, we look for other sources of phosphorus as well. And it may be that there's farm animals in some watersheds or septic systems, really aging ones in very sandy soils. So septics could be an issue. But for the most part, our lake watersheds are, are primarily mostly forested. And the biggest source are, are these camp roads and near shore devel development. So our approach over the last 20 years to deal with these problems, um, we've developed and an approach has been, has been evolving. So we have now a, kind of this these two-step program. Um, there's a, usually a watershed survey takes place where we document the critical source areas in a watershed. And then there's you know, one or more phases of watershed implementation over time where they, people and the locals go ahead and fix the problems that have been identified. So a little bit more about each of those steps. Um, watershed surveys, um, we basically go out and train volunteers to identify erosion problems in their watersheds. So volunteers usually assemble. There's a steering committee that kind of coordinates the whole project in the winter and early spring of each year. And then on a Saturday morning, usually in May, um, after there's a lot of runoff and erosion problems are easier to see, they convene and attend a, a classroom training and then head out into the field to document, um, describe, and rate erosion problems that they see in their watershed. So volunteers usually head off two to four volunteers with a trained uh, technical leader. And you know it works that there's technical resources on each team and also the local knowledge and people that know the landowners and we can talk to people as we go. Um, each team also makes recommendations about best management practices for each site that's identified and also rates the impact and cost of each site. That information, ignore the dot that's in the lake, that, that, doesn't, that needs to be shifted. But um, that information then all comes back together and um, is put together in maps of all the locations of problems in the landscape. And then there's also 
the survey report that comes together also has the, the bulk of it are maps and spreadsheets showing and describing each problem, the nature of the, the problem, the recommendations, the rating, the cost to fix. So um, we found this is a really effective approach, not only in giving a good snapshot in time of the problems in the watershed and what needs to be fixed, but it also sort of in training this cadre of volunteers, there's, you know, it's a great way to start off and, and provide some momentum for stewardship. So by training volunteers, by talking to landowners when we're out doing the survey, and then everyone in the watershed, all watershed properties are notified in advance and receive mailings and follow up information on the findings from the survey. So that sets the stage. Oh, and here's a, um, we have a great manual that is a step-by-step -step guide for planning and carrying out watershed surveys. So uh, to date, about 140 of these surveys have been done over the last 20 years. Um, and then that information in mo many watersheds is then used to um, do implementation. Whether a group applies for 319 funding or not, they usually then start fixing problems. If they access our 319 funds, they tend to, these projects usually include several components, like an outreach component to watershed youth or landowners or public works uh, staff, shown in the top photo. There's usually technical assistance, kind of similar to like River Smart or probably most of your programs where we, the grantees and, and DP staff meets with uh, landowners or road associations um, to look at their properties and make recommendations and give, give recommendations for them to do on their own. Um, and then really the, probably over half of our grant projects, um, the funding and resources go towards putting BMPs on the ground. So cost sharing or providing assistance to help landowners do the work on their, their properties. And of course, there's always sort of tracking and monitoring going on in the background to track our progress over time through water quality monitoring, or also in recent years we've been encouraging groups to keep track of what's going on in their watershed. So um, like these spreadsheets in the back of the survey reports to, take in, um, keep, keep, to keep track of what's been fixed and new problems on the landscape so that they can have a, you know, instead of a snapshot in time to have a, you know, a good look at any point in time about what's happening in their watershed. So that could be as, um, more advanced, like a Google Maps sort of thing where you click on um, the different markers and it brings up a photo of the site and information about the problem or what's been fixed. Um, or it could be, or it could be a spreadsheet that just has a couple more columns added on to the end that sort of documents what's been done and um, makes note of what follow-up action might be needed so the Lake Association can follow up with people that need to be cleaning out their their BMPs and maintaining them. Um, so just to go back, we think this approach can also help with prompting maintenance, but also um, if people are keeping track over time, they won't need to go back and do a watershed survey every 10 years. So you might have noticed I didn't say anything about plans um, and our past approach. And so really, you know, we just had these survey reports and most groups use this to guide their, their actions. Um, and so, as you know, before 2013, watershed-based plans weren't required for protection projects. Um, in 2013, once that requirement came to bear, we had to think about, okay, now how do we do protection, especially since our funding for, for planning was also reduced. Um, we, and now we have maybe only forty or $60,000 in 604B grants to do planning every year. Um, and we really want to reserve those funds for more complicated watersheds like our urban impaired streams where the stressors, we might know that there's a biological impairment, but we don't know what the pollutant of highest concern is or the source area. So we wanted to set aside that money. Um, so we looked at Sandra Fanchulo, for our gracious host from Region 1, um, encouraged us to look at the um, alternative um, plan guidance in the, in, the, in the new EPA guidance. And in case you haven't looked at that, there's EPA provides four different um, types of alternative planning um, allowances. And we are looking at the third, so uh, alternative plans may be used when protecting assessed unimpaired high quality waters. So um, the guidance also set out sort of five things that need to be part of that kind of an uh, of 
alternative plans. And when we looked at what we had as part of our you know, watershed survey reports and process, we realized that a lot of that was really already in place and we just need to pull it together. Um, so over the spring and uh, summer of 2013, we worked with Sandy and some of our local partners to flesh this out a little bit more and provide some guidance. We came up with a guidance document. Um, we worked with a stake, one of our watershed groups to develop an alternative plan so that people could have a template to look at and then checklists as well, so to help make it easy for our watershed partners to develop these plans. Um, the plans um, in our guidance, we make it clear that this, not everyone can go this route. Of course, if it's a marine water, river, or stream watershed, whether it's a protection project or not, they would need to do a nine element plan. Um, but if you were a lake and an un unimpaired water and eligible for our 319 fund, so on our priority list, um, with a recent watershed survey, so you had up-to-date information about the pollution sources in the watershed, you would be eligible, eligible to look at this um, and go for a watershed protection plan. There's a, you know, a cover of a survey report that's a pretty, very critical piece. They needed to have an up updated watershed survey um, to be able to go this route too. So the components, the minimum requirements that we ask for in a watershed-based protection plan um, would be the five elements that EPA requires, but we also asked for two more, um, pretty obvious, to provide some background on the watershed and, and the lake. Um, but also for um, all of our plans, we're really pushing people to identify and spell out who's going to take ownership of the plan and spell out partner roles so that we know that you know, there's greater likelihood of the plan being put, to, put into action. So we asked for that in our lake watershed protection plans as well. So just real quick, um, Ellis Pond is a, is a group that sort of came in the door at the same time of these changes being um, put into place. So Ellis Pond is also known as Roxbury Pond or Silver Lake, if anyone's been in the western Maine foothills. It's a, very, it's a beautiful lake, about a thousand acres surface area. The watershed is pretty large compared to a lot of our lake watersheds, it's about 24 square miles. Um, and you know, pretty high water quality. Um, the watershed, um, like I've mentioned, has, there's a lot of nearshore development, but it also is complicated by some, you know, steep slopes, and there's a lot of active and past logging, ATV trails, and there's also a wind farm on the eastern edge of the watershed. So a lot going on in land use, maybe a little more complicated than our standard lake. But, um, Back in 1994, they did an original watershed survey in the early days of our surveys, and they identified a lot of problems. They did a small 319 grant project, and then it was very quiet for many years, until September 2013 when they experienced a brief but very intense algae bloom on the lake, which was kind of a wake-up call for dealing with their water quality problems. So the stakeholders, including the town and large landowners and the lake association, approached us about doing more work. And um, we broke the news to them that we didn't have a lot of money for planning, um, but that if they got, did a survey and they did a plan, they could potentially access our 319 funds to start fixing things. So they raised $5,000 locally, and we provided support to help um, carry out their watershed survey. So on May 1st, 2014, there were 30 volunteers came to the watershed survey training and we broke up into seven teams, and throughout the course of that day, we surveyed a lot of the watershed, the near shore areas, and then my AmeriCorps volunteer that year worked with um, volunteers to survey the upper watershed. And they found 182 problems. Um, that information then came together. There's a map showing the problems in that watershed. Um, that information then came together to the steering committee that organized the project, and they wanted to keep running with it. So we, um, in, ter in terms of thinking about putting together a plan, they, um, we had some stakeholder meetings where we prioritized and brainstormed action items, and that really formed the basis of the action plan and um, in their, in their watershed-based protection plan, which you'll notice is a very skinny 14 pages that accompanies their watershed survey report, which is a, heft a little bit heftier document. And since then, they've really um, used their plan to focus their actions. The local group has um, 
already done a lot of the action items in their plan, and they applied for a 319 grant, which is just started this past spring. So they're designing and starting to put some of their, their projects on the ground. So um, maybe not every group is as motivated as this local group, but um, they, you know, it has really, once we built this process, it's um, a lot of people have been coming to us and um, carrying out surveys and, and developing these plans. So we have 15 plans that we've accepted to date since 2013. And just to give you a sense, we have 51 plans total accepted in Maine. That's um, both nine element and lake watershed based protection. So about a third of our projects, our plans have come in the last three years and they're this type of plan. So it's a very um, doable sort of undertaking for groups. Um, in terms of the resources that need to go into it, um, really the bulk of the resources go into carrying out the survey um, itself. But once you get that done, it, we figure it seems to take about 30 to 50 hours to prepare and pull the information together and have stakeholder meetings to um, pull together their plan. Um, mostly it's been done by, the, these plans have been developed by professional staff from soil mark conservation districts, for example. But um, one watershed group did it on their own. We, the guidance provides information about where to get the information for each section, and um, the template's very user-friendly. Um, and if you did want to go this route, um, you should note that any alternative plan also needs EPA approval or review. Um, so we let people know that they need to build in a few months to, after they submit the plans to us to have them go through the channels for approvals before they can access and apply for 319 funds. So the challenges remain that we really don't see any more funds coming through for watershed surveys or plan development, but I think the desire to access our implementation funds have been great enough that it really spurs local groups to find resources to get this work done. Um, also, our volunteer lake monitoring program recently accessed some private foundation grant to have many grants go to groups to help them with their watershed surveys as well. So it's sort of like the silver lining seems to be that groups, it's almost making them take more local ownership in, in getting this work done. And of course, the challenge is making sure that the plans are put into action once they're developed as well. But the ben benefit is it seems like this approach has really um, removed a barrier to getting lake um, protection work done. And also, it's provided a little more focus for groups than maybe just the survey report alone has provided in the past and having an action plan put together for, for the local entities to keep running with. And it's a cost effective, it's been very cost effective in developing these and has prompted um, strong local ownership. And of those 15 projects, um, at Lake Watershed Based Protection Plans that have been submitted to us in the last few years, Nine of them now have active 319 grant projects in place, so they're getting work done on the ground. So we do have some um, resources available if you'd like to see what we've developed, um, on the guidance and some templates, and feel free to ask me any questions, um, follow up afterwards, too. All right. All right. Of course, we all want your training slides and materials and forms and spreadsheets, and, and we want all that. Anybody have any questions? Don't go too far. Do you have any components related to on-site septics or natural shoreline um, inventories? So there are a few watersheds we've worked in where septics are um, a large concern, a, a big concern for locals. And actually, um, so there are times, and volunteers are trained to look for anything suspicious in terms of septic system malfunction when they're, we're going on every property. And so we're looking for any breakouts or anything that looks like it could be a septic system failure. But um, a better way of doing that, maybe some groups, and there's actually some of our cross-border lake projects with New Hampshire have done um, follow-up surveys with landowners to get at the septic system issue and, and our on implementation projects in those watersheds include things like our septic socials, fun, fun stuff. Septic socials. Septic socials um, and other outreach around septics as well. Yeah. Others? 
Oh, there you are. Hi, I just uh, out of the plans that you've completed, Barry. Out of the plans that you've completed, <laughs> like talking around Barry, what are the measures or milestones or goals that you're seeing in common in those plans so they can evaluate how they're doing? Yeah, so it's kind of challenging in protection. Where's your endpoint? You're not maybe necessarily knowing what your target is to, that you want to get to. Seems like most groups are targeting what they think is feasible to get to, where they're getting at a, a large enough percentage of the high impact problems to fixing those directly or outreach to get to the, the lower impacts. But most groups sort of, it depends how many problems are in a watershed. Um, if it's a very modest number, they might be aiming for like 90% of the fixes. If it's the Ellis Pond, there's quite a few problems, but I think they were trying to get at maybe like two-thirds of the problems being fixed over time. Nicole. How, since you're doing these surveys, I would assume property access, private property access is a big issue. So do you have guidance in your survey development to address that, and is there a minimum amount of percentage of land that you have to actually have access to in order to have a successful mm -hmm. survey? Yep, that's a good question. I kind of avoided that, but um, so what we do in terms of land, land owner permission, we send letters, make sure that everyone sends a letter to every property owner in the watershed, notifying them about the survey, asking them to be involved, and giving them a chance to opt out of having their properties included. So if we don't hear from people, then we it's an implied consent sort of model. Um, and honestly, in lake watersheds, there's sort of a strong ethic or, and sort of desire to protect the lake. There's usually, I would say, a handful of people that contact us and ask to not have their properties included. And sometimes those are reasons like, you know, they're just nervous because they're not going to be home or, and sometimes it's like, are you kidding me? No, you, can, you can't come on my property. And we respect that and, and opt those out. But for the most part, it's a very small fraction of properties that aren't allowed. All right. Thanks again. That right. was great. And uh, I wanted to mention real quick, I see a lot of evaluation forms being filled out. That's very good. Again, that's our field data here for this uh, field exercise. That's how we know what we need to improve next time. So we really do appreciate you uh, making some marks on those. Oh, you've got it under control. You're quick. All right, next up we have uh, the topic is working across state and regional boundaries to protect and restore a national treasure. Treasure Brad Krebs from the Nature Conservancy. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate the chance to come and speak with you. Uh, I work for the Nature Conservancy, and I can just say generally, uh, you know, the Nature Conservancy as a nonprofit really appreciates all the work that EPA and the states <clears throat> are doing across the country to protect our, our water resources and to address nonpoint source um, stresses as well as protect healthy watersheds, and, and we are also deeply invested in that work as a nonprofit. So hopefully, some of you have, have had projects or interactions with the Nature Conservancy, and they've been positive and productive. If not, I, I would encourage you to think about ways to work with the Conservancy. I'm going to talk today about a really um, great partnership that the Nature Conservancy and EPA's Region Three and Four and the states of Virginia and Tennessee have in a specific place, the Clinch and Powell River watershed, which straddles the border between Virginia and Tennessee in, in the mountains, uh, in the Appalachian Mountains. Sure, is that better? Um, and what I'm going to try to do is, in, in terms of talking about um, our partnership with EPA and the states in the Clinch Powell watershed, I've heard a lot of great things the last few days. I'm going to try to highlight connections between our work in this place and some of the things I've heard yesterday in terms of strategies around nonpoint source and creative use of funding programs in the course today in terms of thinking about protecting healthy watersheds. Um, but overall, what I want to do is just real quickly, for those of you who may not be familiar with um, far southwestern Virginia, northeast Tennessee, that mountainous area, I want to talk just briefly about the national importance of, of the river systems that we have in that, in that very unique, special place. And then I'm going to talk about our, our partnership with EPA in the states that we call the Clinch Powell Clean Rivers Initiative. I want to talk a little bit ha about how we work together, um, and then I want to focus on how we're using science to better characterize pollutants and sources of stress and dealing with those, as well as talking about um, some work we've got 
going on around healthy watersheds. We were one of the pilot areas uh, to complete an a integrated healthy watershed assessment with support from EPA. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that assessment and then how that is driving us towards focusing on some certain strategies moving forward. So if, if you've never seen this map, this is a map that the Nature Conservancy put out quite a few years ago now, but it's still extremely relevant. It's mapping concentrations of biodiversity and rare species across the United States. And the Clinch Pal watershed, which I'm talking about today, is in one of the hottest spots in the country in terms of biodiversity and rare species. The Clinch River uh, has the highest concentration of rare aquatic species in the U.S., and the Pal is not far behind. I think it's number three. So we have an incredible collection of rare species and aquatic diversity um, that has driven the Nature Conservancy to work in this place, but also many other agencies, federal and state agencies, um, to, to work here as well. And so one of our big goals in forming the, the Clinch Powell Clean Rivers Initiative is to try to figure out how we can all work better together in a more integrated way to do more to protect this, this special place and, and help the people that depend on it. There's a lot going on in this watershed, just to give you a little bit of sense of, of the place. Um, it's a very rural area with a lot of natural cover, but it's right uh, along the, the boundary between the Appalachian Plateau region, which has a lot of coal, natural gas resources, and the, the Ridge and Valley, which is more agricultural. So part of this watershed is very influenced by uh, extractive industries, particularly coal mining, uh, and that's been a big part of, of our watershed work and focus. Um, but we also have a lot of agricultural influences. We also have a lot of influences from, from developed areas along the rivers. The topography in this area is such that everything is built right next to the creek. So while the entire area generally is rural and has a lot of natural land cover, if you just looked at a 100-meter buffer around all the streams, you'd see roads, railroads, houses. You know, so, so that's a really interesting component to, to, the, to the watershed. Um, freshwater mussels is one of the things that really makes the Clinch Pow such a unique place and such a national treasure. Um, we have over 40 species of these mussels. We have 20 in endangered species that are, that are listed. Um, we have a third of the entire fish diversity in the entire Tennessee River drain is just found in these, in these two rivers in southwest Virginia and northeast Tennessee. Um, so it's an incredible biological resource. Um, and, and interestingly enough, one of the things that really brought the states together initially uh, to form the, the Clinch Powell Clean Rivers Initiative and to begin working with the Nature Conservancy and EPA um, was driven by the fact that we have a, a very tenuous situation in terms of the health of these rare species. Um, over the last 10 to 15 years, analysis of, of data has really started to show a precipitous decline uh, in, these, in these rare mussel species. And so the map I'm showing you shows the, the rivers in Virginia going into Tennessee, and these, these five red areas essentially show the, the last strongholds for these mussels. Um, so what we've had is, in, in long stretches of the river, we've seen tremendous drop-off in terms of their, their population health, their reproductive rates, their recruitment of juveniles into the population. And this is what really kind of forced the conversation between Virginia and Tennessee around this watershed. In Virginia, you have a lot of point sources, particularly from coal mining, and then you've also got non-point source influences from ag and urban areas. I say urban, they're basically small towns along the river. Tennessee is very rural, uh, very agricultural, and so um, there was some, some very tense conversations uh, eight or nine years ago between the two states, with Tennessee basically saying, you know, our mussels are threatened. A lot of the healthiest mussels are, are down on the Tennessee side. Our mussels are threatened by activities going on in Virginia, particularly coal mining um, was, was the assertion made. Um, and, and Tennessee really um, challenged Virginia uh, to, co to come to the table to figure out how um, some of those issues could be addressed. And, and out of that conflict was really our watershed initiative was born and the Nature Conservancy became involved as a facilitator uh, to help the conversation move along between the states and to get focused on some key questions, some science to solve those questions, and then helping develop plans to move forward. So, you know, I, I say that the EPA and the states and the conservancy are, you know, part of this partnership, which is absolutely right, and, and there's actually an MOU between the two states focused on the clinch bow. But we have reached out to a much broader collection of partners uh, to form our watershed initiative. So there are other federal agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service, the USGS, 
There are other state agencies, uh, the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy, um, Virginia Department of Conservation. There are research universities, the Virginia Tech, North Carolina State, and, and other nonprofits, as well as members of industry. Um, very early on, we wanted to reach out to industry and involve them in our, in our efforts. Uh, so the coal industry, the gas industry, local communities have all been engaged in different ways um, in, in our efforts. So we, work, we focus on four main things, and I'm just really going to focus on two as I, as I kind of go through the rest of the talk. But we're doing a lot of really interesting scientific work to try to understand why the mussels are declining. Uh, and, and Virginia DEQ and, and TDEC and EPA have all stepped up in a very big way to work with us, our scientists, and other partners to collect new information about water quality and mussel health to really try to figure out what the, what the stressor is. Um, there's a lot of coordination between the states around the Clean Water Act and the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act that has been a focus of our initiative and our MOU over the last eight years. I'm not really going to get into a lot of that, but that's been a big focus. We've done a lot of uh, outreach, public symposiums to key audiences. We had a huge meeting with the coal industry. We've met with localities around water resource planning. So there's been a lot of targeted outreach to key groups in the watershed. Um, and then we've also figured out how do we combine our available resources to strategically protect and restore key parts of this watershed. So I'm going to focus on the science a little bit, and then I want to focus on that last piece of really working together to get focused around protection and restoration, because that's where some of the watershed planning really comes into play. So in terms of the science, um, you know, this is it's an interesting situation here where, on the one hand, uh, we have a healthy watershed that's got some of the most unique species in the entire country has a lot of you know, scores really well in terms of natural land cover and, and hydrologic dynamics and physical habitat and, and, and biology. On the other hand, um, there's a lot of impaired streams in this watershed too. It, it, so it's a mixed bag. Um, we have bacterial impairments and some sediment and benthic impairments. So it's not, it's not you know, you can't really sort these things necessarily into two clean groups. But, but the science team has taken a, a stab at this where what they've done is they've essentially broken the river into different sections. And some of those sections have healthy rare mussel species. Other sections don't. And what they've done is they've collected consistently different types of water quality, biological, chemical, um, physical habitat information in all those different stretches. And they're trying to discern or discriminate. Are there certain things about the unhealthy reaches that, that show up that are significantly different than the healthy reaches? If we can figure that out, then we can start to understand why we're seeing uh, muscle struggle in certain areas. So that's the, the basic premise for the science team's work. And again, this has been, you know, the EPA labs have been involved, the state labs, um, the USGS. We've gotten money from the Office of Surface Mining. The coal industry's put money into this. The Nature Conservancy has. It's been an incredible uh, multi-year investment in work. Um, these are just a few pictures of the different, uh, different pieces of uh, work going on. One of the things that's really interesting, and in addition to um, collecting water quality data, um, we've also actually used mussels as a bioindicator, and we've put mussels out in the river in these different sites, and we've looked at how they have, you know, accumulated metals in their tissue. Um, what, what sort of we've done a lot of histological analysis of, uh, of body burden studies, and how are their organs developing, and are we seeing differences in development of juvenile mussels in impaired reaches versus healthy reaches? So the, the punchline is there's a lot to learn, but, but some of the things that are emerging for us are that we see patterns between uh, concentrations of PAHs, um, certain trace metals, as well as dissolved solids, helping to explain this difference between healthy muscles and unhealthy, unhealthy, unhealthy muscles. The challenge, though, is the understanding the significance of those differences and also whether or not there are actual toxicological thresholds. Um, that we can understand, and that's sort of where the science is going next because in terms of thinking about the Clean Water Act, if, if we're going to try to you know, create a new water quality standard, the science has to be extremely solid in terms of a relationship between a particular stressor you know, and a response, and we're not quite there yet. Um, but on the non-point source side, it's interesting for us to think about you know, if, if PAHs are really the problem, what are, what are the sources there? We have runoff from abandoned coal mine lands or from from build environment areas, how do we go back to those sources and develop tools and use the programs that y'all have been talking about to, to correct those types of problems? Those pollutants are not in the current 
uh, TMDL studies that we have. So this is science that's out ahead of where um, the, you know, the current TMDL studies are, are, are characterizing the watershed. So that's a little bit about the science. We could spend a lot of time on that, but, but I'll move on to the last part, which is protecting healthy watersheds, protecting what we've got left. Um, there's certainly a lot of restoration that we have to do, but we also have really impressive uh, and very healthy sub-watersheds within the Clinch Pal. Um, and so we were really blessed uh, to get support from, from EPA Office of Water, Laura Gabanski, when, when she was still um, with EPA, uh, participated in some of our steering committee meetings and projects and got excited about the work. And so we piloted um, an application of EPA's watershed assessment protocol in the, in the Clinch Pal. So this is a little different. It's not a state level assessment, it's assessing a couple of HUP 12, so you're a very different scale. Um, but our broad partnership was able to put together a technical team to work with EPA uh, and, a third, and a contractor to develop an integrated assessment of the Clinch PAL. And you know, we, used, we used all the six uh, measures. We actually didn't use the physical habitat measure um, because we had some surrogates that worked well. Um, but but we, you know, we looked at biology, we looked at um, landscape condition. We, we focused on, again, that, that active river area section around the streams as a, as a really important metric beyond just the watershed condition. Um, but at any rate, we were able to, to have a really good process to roll up this study and report um, that helped us characterize relative watershed health within this, this you know, much smaller system than, say, a state level. So we put together a couple fact sheets because one of the things the group felt really strongly about was this is all really sciencey, technical, and how do we make this more accessible to people living in the watershed? How can we communicate some of these results in a way that's compelling to you know town planners and, and landowners and industry? And so we, we put together a couple of fact sheets that really kind of distilled down the results of the of the report and the study, um, and we also you know, offered ideas for things that different, you know, different groups could do to help keep the watershed healthy. Um, but th there were some very interesting results. We, we, we could aggregate results. This shows results aggregated at the, um, I think, at the 14-digit HUC scale. But we could drill down to that sort of one square mile catchment scale as well. Um, and the results are really interesting to us. Um, you know, we had some really good data in certain dimensions. And so some areas we were we, we saw what we expected. In other places, we were a little puzzled, and, and the, the muscle health didn't track necessarily with uh, some of the other metrics. So that, that was you know, interesting to us. Um, but it, you know, that study was finished um, this, this past spring, and so as the initiative's going forward, we're actually getting ready to revise our, our MOU for another 10 years. And one of the key questions I think we're going to have is, to what extent can we apply you know, the results of this healthy watershed plan, um, can it help guide our future investment? You know, we have a lot of partners with a lot of different programs. Which of those programs are flexible enough that we can apply them towards protection of some of these, these really healthy watershed areas? At, from the conservancy standpoint, you know, we're really interested in leveraging our own private funding, potentially with, with public funding sources around protection. And we've, we've actually got some really interesting immediate opportunities to do some pretty large-scale land acquisition work in some of these really healthy areas. Um, but we could really use help in terms of some, some public funding around securing long-term conservation easements or, or other sort of long-term outcomes. So I think in our case, we, we have a roadmap now that we've built together, and there's some great opportunities for co-investments in the future. But a key question that that we have and will wrestle with is what are the what programs have enough flexibility that they can be directed towards uh, protection work. Uh, one more slide or one more future application I wanted to mention. Um, we, we also were excited recently, a few folks have mentioned NRCS this morning. Um, again, the, the, our whole partnership was able to really you know, throw its collective uh, influence around an application to the NRCS resource Regional Conservation Partnerships Program. We're really excited that we received a four and a half million dollar grant from that program this year. We've got basically it's a five year program, but really when you get down to it, we've got three years to implement. But we've got five counties in the Clinch Pal where we've got you know strong partnerships with the Soil and Water Districts and the local NRCS office 
um, we've got that, that's four and a half million dollars of additional funding that we can put on the ground for restoration and protection, and we can leverage that funding with conservancy dollars, other partner dollars like Tennessee Valley Authority, um, and we're going to really try to use that water, healthy watershed assessment to help prioritize some of those projects on the ground. We we get to set up a local advisory group that will score projects, and we, we're thinking about ways we can incorporate you know, some of the priorities of the watershed assessment into a scoring criteria that will help drive dollars to, to healthy areas. So kind of went through a lot of stuff there, but um, again, I really appreciate the chance to speak with you all. And again, you know, the Conservancy is we're looking for opportunities to work with everybody here, so I, I hope we can find some. We certainly have some in, in southwest Virginia and northeast Tennessee. Thanks. Great presentation, great picture. Questions, got a few back here. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. I'm curious what are the types of projects that you would be doing as part of your $4 million grant? Are they mostly protection projects or some restoration projects? Um, it'll be a mix. The, the money is going to come through the EQIP program. Uh, so it's going to be focused on agri the agricultural portions of the of the watershed, and primarily it'll be working with landowners on BMPs. Um, some will involve riparian restoration and water systems. Others can involve protection of intact habitat. So it'll be a mix of those. Yes, coal mining has been going on in Southwest Virginia for over a hundred years, and there's a lot less of it going on now than it was 30 years ago when I worked there. And environmental regulations on coal have been in place in Virginia since the 1970s. So it just seems rather curious to me that if just in the last 15 years we're seeing this precipitous impact and decline on freshwater mussels. I just would just suggest to you that it's probably something else that you want to be looking for. Yeah, that's been a, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, th there's a longer term trend line of decline, certainly. Um, but there, there has been this notable drop-off. One of the things that came up uh, that was interesting was we have seen a, a significant rise in dissolved solids since the mid-90s, uh, and there's, there's some sort of temporal correlation between that and the expansion of larger um, surface mine footprints. So, um, again, those are correlations, and one of the reasons we have had an industry involved from the beginning is to you know really work with them to try to collect information and understand. They're certainly the only they're one of multiple players in the watershed, so we're really trying to tease out those different patterns. Great. Um, so I'm just a, I'll, I'll admit up front I'm on that science team and I'm involved in that too, and I, I we have looked at that, Daryl too, and and. Uh, that's a really good point, and we've tried not to point fingers in order to keep everybody at the table. Um, and one of the groups that's been the hardest to get to the table all the time in Appalachia uh, coal fields is, is and the ag folks in the, in the community are the local citizens that live, you know, right next to the watershed and have the straight pipes and have the um, um, have have the some of the biggest potential to contribute directly to the to the watershed and you you showed a lot of the um, groups that are big partners in here but you've done a lot of work we've done a lot of work with the localities and trying to to, to um, get to those local work group areas too can you um, describe some of that success and the um, some of the other things that are going on relative to the local citizens because I think that's really one what I think will be the keys to success here. Yeah, real quick, uh, you know, along with all this agency coordination work, there's been a real rise in local awareness about the value of the river as, a, as an asset. Um, and a lot of that actually parallels the recognition that the coal industry is in severe decline. So there's a lot of economic insecurity in the region because the coal industry has been the primary driver. Um, so a lot of citizen groups have started to really embrace the river as a natural asset for recreation and economic development. And, and we've been working very closely you know, with them on those, those kinds of efforts. Probably the most tangible outcome of that side of things is that uh, through uh, local engagement and, and building a coalition, the state
state has now established and will be establishing a new state linear state park on the on the Clinch River and has allocated uh, re significant resources to buy land along the river. That wouldn't have happened without the engagement of the citizens. So one of the things we're trying to do with this initiative is connect it with people and help people understand the condition of the river so that they can make informed choices going forward. So there is a lot of citizen energy around the river that we hadn't really haven't seen before, and it's really very exciting. All right, very Thank good. You. Thank you again, Todd. I'm sorry, Brad. All right, next up we have Todd, developing a watershed-based ecological health conservation plan for the Juwan Basin. Todd Janeski from the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation. And let me just say quickly, thanks to Vivian Doyle and Cindy Gilder for organizing this session. This has been very good. And Todd is up and ready to go. All right, great. So uh, it's uh, 13 minutes to 12. So uh, I'm in between you and either leaving or that field trip or the closing remarks. So put your seatbelts on. I'm going to go really quick um, or such, something like that. Okay, so um, I'm going to go through a couple of things here. Um, this is an interesting panel, actually. I'm sitting back, and maybe we couldn't have coordinated this even better if I, if I had planned it myself. Um, but the discussions we're hearing today really about this, you know, um, watershed planning and protection aspects are kind of unique in this. And what I'm going to talk about really is the process that we went through in Virginia uh, to uh, evaluate protection activities for the Healthy Waters Program in Virginia in a specific uh, southeast coastal, somewhat coastal watershed. And um, I'm going to talk about the process, the integration. We're going to talk about some outputs that we were looking to have um, that are going to inform a lot of the conversations we just heard, and then how we apply those locally. So uh, what is what is our Healthy Waters Program in Virginia? Um, it's an interagency partnership um, at our Department of Conservation, Division of Natural Heritage, Virginia Commonwealth University, which I wear a hat for both, um, our Department of Environmental Quality, and it's to identify and maintain um, water bodies, watersheds, streams with high ecological integrity. It's not a water quality program. It's not an enforcement program. It's solely based on um, identifying um, high ecological integrity, aquatic integrity. And it's based on a number of, uh, of, of, of issues, you know, high native species, broad biodiversity, you know, a, a, a spread between um, native predators, presence of migratory fish species, and it's looking at the ratio compared to the, the opposite of those issues that are there. Um, and then how they provide ecosystem services and some social and economic benefits as well. And it's really based on a broad partnership beyond just those three entities. And this project's going to talk a bit of uh, how we've worked with conservation districts, Nature Conservancy, uh, the state of North Carolina, Albemarle Pimlico National Estuary Program. If you sat in the coastal session yesterday, you got to hear some more about uh, NEPs. Our program started in 2002. Um, and I was saying earlier to Steve, you know, we, we worked with uh, Laura Gabansky to help create the national program that we were one of the, one of the test cases of how, is, how could it be done, what's one approach that could be used here. And, and our approach that we, we, our bioassessment protocol was one that was evaluated and it's discussed in that large three-inch book that you can uh, leaf through when you're kind of sleepy at night. Um, it is a blue-green conservation program. It's really trying to weigh those issues and it's administered as a city at Heritage. Um, InStream is the interactive stream assessment resource. It is a multi-metric uh, ecological assessment. It's, uh, it's based on a modeled condition and a modeled reference condition. So unlike EPA and some of the assessment protocols with like RBB3, which we've got a reference stream, it's based on data density. So the more data we have, the more available we have to make a reference condition based on those, on those actual um, data that are there. And we've looked at about 2,500 uh, stream systems in the state primarily focused in Virginia within the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which encompasses about two-thirds of the state. Um, and we've got about 350 waters right now identified as healthy or exceptional or higher than healthy. And we've got a website. It's housed at VCU. That's, so you can see our link there, instar.vcu.edu, and you can look at it. It's actually a lightweight version that you can scroll around and find information on it. Clicky-click. Um, again, the model reference, the model metrics that we use in there, this is the list of what we include. Um, for the most part, we're really focused on a biological assessment. So we're looking at macroinvertebrates and we're looking at fish assemblages. Um, we do look at um, the riparian cover. We look at geomorphic conditions. But the model really weights it most heavily on those biological indices that are in there. Um, this is kind of a, a, a representative of what the data look like for Chesapeake Bay and how we make our, uh, our, our you know, criteria and where we draw the line for what's healthy and what's exceptional. Basically, and basically anything scoring higher than a 70 on our scale becomes healthy. Anything above uh, a 90 is exceptional within that 
in that category. Uh, this is uh, this map's constantly being updated, so it's kind of like you published something, right? I think I could have taken this thing yesterday, and as of today, with more data being moved from VCU to Heritage, the map's updated. But this is what it looks like. This is what it looked like um, at the last time I updated this slide. Uh, you can see most of our data density is coastal, and it's Bay related. That's because our funding sources primarily have come from Bay program funding. Uh, through uh, our Department of Environmental Quality or through our Coastal Zone Management Program. So a lot of our data focus is there. What you really notice in this and what I notice and get really nervous about is the data gap in that giant westward and southern rivers area uh, that we're really, you know, weak in where we have. And, and you know, Brad and I work together and have talked a lot about how do, we, how do we get programmatic consistency between what our program at the state calls healthy and how we refer to other resources that are considered healthy and other biological criteria or other assessed resources that are out there. Um, not to refute in any way. I mean, I want to support uh, those data that are there and also expand what we have so we've got a bigger coverage within, within the state. Um, so we focused a project within the Chowan Basin. The Chowan is a, um, what we refer to as a blackwater system. It's a low gradient uh, system dominated by, uh, by cypress, high acidic, low DO, uh, you know, really unique fish assemblages in there. And um, we were we actually got a Region 3 grant to conduct an assessment of this area with a couple of different outputs. Um, one of them, one of the real primary ones, was to develop a, a nine key elements, an A through I criteria for, uh, for protection. You know, we heard about Maine's approach and, some of the, and how they modified what was there. We actually said, we're gonna create an, a, a nine step, and I'll talk about that nine step that we had there. This is Cho Wan. Um, it's, uh, it's three basins, it's, it's the Chowan main stem, uh, but it's the Meharan, Nottoway, and Blackwater River systems. You can see in that lower indicator map, it's in the southwest part of the state, drains in North Carolina, and so as part of this, we work really closely with the state of North Carolina uh, with this project, and the original output was to look at um, developing conservation plans that didn't just isolate one watershed, but it was a Virginia, North Carolina, and then a border one. What we ended up doing was looking at just one watershed because really it was the best way to really communicate the process we were trying to, to, uh, to get out of. How do we apply that non-key elements approach? Um, part of the objective there was to advance uh, uh, interstate um, coordination, and we were to develop an MOU between the states. When the project was initiated, we were underway and negotiating with the commissioner's office in the state of North Carolina and at that time, we didn't have a very friendly um, administration in the state of Virginia, and they actually directed us not to do that anymore. Um, so we had to basically throw our stuff away. Of course, nothing gets thrown away, right? Um, it's waiting for the next opportunity is the way I look at it as. Um, and then, unfortunately, North Carolina became really unfriendly. Anybody here from North Carolina? <laughs> hey, you're still employed? Awesome. Yeah, North Carolina's been hacked up, and we witnessed that. The Heritage Program, which I'm part of at, uh, in DCR, we saw that, and a lot of our contacts on the other side, which we were working with, all of a sudden were gone. Uh, that's really difficult to make progress when you see half of an office completely annihilated. Um, anyway, part of what we, we saw an opportunity there was that the Chowan Basin was part of the Albemarle Pamlico uh, National Estuary Partnership, uh, and that they had a, uh, their conservation and ma comprehensive conservation and management plan, the CCMP. This is sort of their roadmap for how they do things. Yesterday, there was a whole panel on uh, NEPs, and this is, you know, their all of their objectives on water quality and community engagement on any sort of aspects that are relevant to uh, to their region. So we wanted to inform the CCMP with the North Carolina with this, since it is a bi-state effort. Chowan Basin, really kind of quick overview. I'm not going to go into a lot of dis issues here. It's 3.2 million acres. Um, you know, there's 9,900 square miles uh, of, uh, of or, or, or linear miles of stream within this system. It is designated as scenic water body in, in certain areas, and the primary land use in here, and this is really an interesting thing for us, was forestry, agriculture. Those are the two primary areas, and it's peanuts and pine. Um, in this area, we actually have a peanut, pine, and pork festival. Um, and it is great, right? Actually, I was just down there the other day driving through there, and the, uh, the cotton is in, ready to be harvested right now. It's gorgeous. Um, definitely a unique, uh, unique area, very rural. And uh, that forestry aspect played a major role into, into this project. This is sort of a rough outline of that area when we turned on all of our natural heritage data. Now, I'm not going to try to explain what all the little blips and blobs on there are, but they're relative issues, whether they're terrestrial, they're uh, vertebrate, they are um, you know, any species or communities of concern based on heritage resource data. And being that we're within the heritage program, we wanted to look at the terrestrial comparison, not just the aquatic, land, the, the aquatic pieces that were in there. We actually had in the past, through some coastal monies, conducted an assessment of the Blackwater River. 
um, that Blackwater Basin is actually in helping inform uh, the results of which um, the uh, Section 7, the Blackwater um, definitions in the state of Virginia of, of, you know, how do we not restore a system um, beyond what it's actually intended to be. I mean, these are, you know, like I said, high city, low DO, and if we try and restore it to the opposite of those things to meet water quality standards, we lose all of our endemic species. Really, from an ecological perspective, and what we're doing, that's really a bad policy. Um, so we've helped inform that process there. Um, our initial assessment of what we did here to move into the Chowan, we conducted um, two different models. We conducted a watershed integrity model, which looks at landscape features as it relates to aquatic integrity and water quality um, results. Not water quality, but aquatic um, community results. And a subset of that is the Applied terrest Index of Terrestrial Integrity. Um, it's, it's ITI, and it's actually four metrics. And I wrote them down because I always mix them up. And I always So basically, the ITI is, is truly a terrestrial analysis. And this really helps us refine what was in there. And it's the, um, the National Land Cover, or the National Cover Index from Tyner. These are all Tyner metrics from 2004. Uh, the River and Stream Corridor Integrity Index, the Habitat Fragmentation uh, Index, and then there's an impervious surface one. Now, while the previous habitat fragmentation is sort of a roads index may be somewhat duplicative, in this instance, because it's primary forced in that area, it's actually a really applicable um, case, and the impervious surface is really a lesser one because it's truly um, an agricultural area. What that does, those two models are fined, allowed us to take a truly limited budget. The INSTAR approach is a probabilistic approach. Classic, close your eyes, throw the dart. This is where we're going to sample. We didn't have the resources to conduct a full assessment of the entire Chowan that way. So we used the watershed integrity model and the ITI to really focus where we're going to go. So it's sort of a soft approach for a, for a problem on. Um, what we then did is within those areas, uh, so this is the result of what that is. So the blue areas on here, dark blue, indicate the highest quality likely areas. Um, we then focused those areas into this is where we're going to conduct our prob mod. So then we closed our eyes, removed the, the rest of the map and threw our darts into where we're going to sample. Um, the result of which um, was also informed by this. Since this is a primarily forested area, one of the things that came online was the uh, construction of two new paper or, or uh, fiber processing areas. Um, as I said, this is, uh, it's, it's softwoods, it's pulpwoods, and it's hardwoods in there. And there were two processing mills that were going on with a 75-mile overlapping concentric um, radius of extraction that was for the European pellet industry. And the European pellet industry, we use this to leverage to our advantage later on as well. You know, they're looking for a green product. So they're shipping our you know, pulp products overseas into the European market for heating. Um, this really put what we're doing into, the, into an additional focus of who are we going to be addressing most directly. Um, so data development, won't go into a ton. I got some cool pictures that are better than going through all the, the, uh, the text on it. We looked at 109 different streams, 41 of, or 14 of them are non-weightable. So we had to create a standard for how do we assess within a non-weightable system. And we actually you know, kind of modified a typical boat approach on that one. We ran into some seasonal issues on this. We actually had one, uh, one full season of drought and then one full season of flood. Um, really not conducive for trying to get in there and do assessments. And so that also extended our, our whole project was. But ultimately, we came up with more than 200 ar archival cl um, co collections. And um, we were able to rank scores that um, you know, really allowed us to come up with, uh, with what might be areas that we can conserve. Um, this is what our site collection distribution looked like. So after we did the prob mod, you can see we went from that little kind of um, circular areas into where we actually sampled. The upper Meharan didn't make the cut because that really was one of the spots, upper headwaters, that was dry and then flooded. And it really kept us out of there in those higher areas. Um, we then refined and looked even further in, once those basins were in, into what areas we might be looking at further detail. This is sort of an example of what we're looking at these streams. You know, I was in New England for a long time and love our New England streams. You know, it's, it's got boulder cobble. It's, you know, glacially influenced. Not this stuff. This is low level. This is flat. These are flooded mangrove, not mangroves, but flooded cypress swamps, you know, and really unique, beautiful from their own standpoint. Um, I mean, and, they're, and they're named after swamps, Jones Swamp, Rainer Swamp, uh, Black Swamp. Um, hey, what a surprise. Pretty crazy. Gozy Swamp. Um, and this is some of our bigger, more non-weightable areas. It was mouth of uh, Buckhorn Creek. And then here's the main stem of the Meharan, which really was a weightable stretch, even though here under a higher flow, it doesn't look too much. Um, some of the cool species we got in here, some really unique stuff, black-banded sunfish, um, some banded and blue-spotted sunfish. These are really unique endemic species that are not found anywhere else within these systems. And these are globally and staked um, species. 
uh, uh, flyers, redfin pickerels, not so high on the ranking list, but really friggin' cool fish. Um, sorry, I love redfin pickerels. I had one in a fish tank as a kid. thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Um, anyway, so some of the provisional conclusions is that the approach to look at this, this HUC 12-based assessment of using our watershed integrity model and then a subset of it using the, the modified index of terrestrial integrity is a really good way of taking what we would normally assess solely based on aquatic field collected data as an initial remote-based cursory, let's look at where we're going to go. How do we really distribute limited funding? Um, no surprise, healthy streams were more common in the higher gradient landscapes um, and more of them in, in Virginia than North, than North Carolina. And that mostly was because the lower stretches in the main stem of Chowan was bigger areas, more developed. No surprise. Um, but, and we also compare, we compare everything in Virginia to the Chesapeake Bay. It gets a little old after a while. However, 70% um, of what we saw there exhibited high ecological integrity. Now, we don't typically, our instar doesn't compare basin to basin, but we kind of made that comparison for this instance to look at how it might it uh, look on a broader scale. But uh, it really, the, the result was that there's a distinct connection with our blue and green linkages. So now I'm going to run into really quickly the nine key elements. Um, I'm really blown through my time. I guess I'm uh, doing my best here. Okay. So here's the standard um, A through I criteria you're used to, and here's what we developed. And I'm going to not spend a ton of time, but I do want to look at some of the issues that were in here. Um, the real important ones of, of what's different between our nine key elements that we're proposing is, is A, B, and C. Um, and the, the means that we really approached that with was with these initial remote analysis and our NSTAR. Of, of how do we quantify and verify with an empirical analysis for aquatic communities. It's not water quality based. We're not looking at non-point source. We're looking at aquatic community based uh, results here. And then B is really identify those conditions to maintain A, right? It's the same thing within, you know, the previous one in B when we're looking at loading. Um, and if you're hoping or wondering, this is all going to be available on PDF afterwards, I understand, from Nui Pick. Um, and then the last one is really, well, I guess going back to that is, is how do we and what resources did we use to, to identify those conditions? You know, what data did we really find that were the most useful for B? And then finally C were, you know, what were those best management practices? And in this situation, it really was agricultural, forestry, um, and land conservation were the primary focus of the efforts. We, the communities that are here, we don't have great access. Uh, there's not great participation from local government. Um, they're, they're very rural. They're very limited in staff. Most of the agriculture, most of the zoning in there is agriculturally zoned. It's not residential zoned. There's highways that go through, and there's you know a, a few residential areas within there. So there's not a lot of comprehensive planning opportunities, which we thought, hey, we're going to modify ordinances. Well, there really weren't any to modify. Um, you know, and then besides that, engaging the county of Suffolk or Isle of Wight really was kind of like pulling teeth. Um, so looking at uh, Raccoon Creek, this is a shot of Raccoon Creek. How do we apply that A through I criteria and what do we find here? So this is now Nottaway within that show on. Uh, it contains Fort Pickett, which is uh, an Army training facility, uh, 41,000 um, uh, National Guard, 41,000 acres, with their own conservation management plan, which was, which was a wonderful thing to have access to and to work with the staff on that site for both assessment and influencing their outcome. Primary land use, as I said here, with Nottaway, 55% forested, 20, almost 20% agricultural, and 10% wetlands. Um, and this is NLCD um, um, on those. So again, this is our locator. You saw that before, Nottaway's dead center. Um, this looks at the area of, of Raccoon Creek down uh, just off of I-85 on the way to North Carolina into Roanoke Rapids. Um, and then this is a close-up. This is really where we, in our A, how we moved um, into identifying what's here. We looked at two really real terrestrial databases that we had within Heritage, and it's, it's the Virginia Conservation Vision, as referred to, often referred to previously as the Conservation Land, need, conservation, uh, land Needs Assessment or, um, in Virginia, sometimes called Vanilla. Um, what this looks at is it's, is it's also a modeled condition of terrestrial integrity. Um, what are the communities that are there, and how are they ranked based on the relative value? We then also turn on the second layer, which is difficult to see in this map, where what are the lands that are currently under conservation uh, or protected lands? And you can't quite see, I wish I could get the little cursor, there we go. In this area, there's actually Nature Conservancy owns a, a large parcel that overlaps between a very high quality and high quality resources on that. And coincidentally, it's pretty close to our lower site, which we're basing our whole thing on, which is this is our exceptional location within uh, the basin. Um, Additionally, 
we had wellhead protection that was identified here. Right smack dab, couldn't have asked for better wellhead placement zones, you know, if I had gone to the Department of Health and said, could you put those circles right there for me? Um, right there at, the, at that area. So we really were looking at the entire contributing drainage we're affecting and informing that area. And then we looked at the NLCD uh, forested wetlands. Hey, what a surprise. It's low gradient. It's black water systems. It's all confined to forested wetlands in there. Um, and as we went through our process, this was something that uh, I somewhat argued but EPA had asked for was, you know, what's a linear measurement that's relative uh, for, for conservation in this area? You know, I kept saying it's a surface area, it's acreage, protect the wetlands, that's what's really valuable here. Well, it's about 34, you know, linear miles of, uh, of, of acreage that was there. So here's how we began to apply it, and this is where I really chopped down my presentation earlier because I knew I was last. So I'm going to run through a few things that were in here, and this is the A, how do we quantify? So as I mentioned, you know, these are the, the pH and the seasonal hypoxia, you know, we've got really unique conditions that are here that, that are indicative of, of, of these black water systems. We had your very unique fish assemblage that were in there, you know, swamp fish, mud sunfish, black banded sunfish, as I showed. Um, and then we looked at within there, too, these, you know, vascular and, uh, and vertebrate um, global and state ranked species that were there. Again, these are now coming back to heritage terrestrial information there. Um, we had these, uh, these natural landscape assessment high and very high values, 1,400 acres and then 4,800 acres respectively between those. And then it had this 1,400 acres of Nature Conservancy uh, conservation easement and then a drinking water um, area within that. Here's our NLCD, the, what I didn't highlight in there, I thought I did on this. There's 10 acres um, or there's 10 percent and about 1,300 acres of forested wetlands that were in here that we identified as our priority, uh, 31.4, sorry in my decimal around a little bit. The identify the conditions. We want to preserve those forested wetlands within the area. That's our goal. And we looked at that goal, and as we get into it, and I don't go into details because I chopped this out, over a 20-year time period is what we looked at. Land conservation, unlike applying, you know, um, you know cattle exclusion and fencing, takes a long time. It's, it's property negotiations, whether it's a conservation easement or it's some sort of, you know, changes in practices. Um, it's a longer process and it also is a difficult thing to, to quantify as far as valuation at this point and into the future. We wanted to really see an insurance of a protection of those 1,300 acres uh, per that uh, NLCD, that 34 mile, 31 miles. Um, and we saw the unique partnerships, and this will come in later, that who were the players here? It's conservation district, it's conservancy, it's us, it's DEQ, and, uh, and it's the Virginia Department of Forestry um, were, were some major ones that we wanted to look at specifically what we saw was, as we talked about this is an extraction area, we wanted to see an application of, this, of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative standards at 100% um, of those areas at point of extraction. So this is the whole green, the green process. You can call a product green if it comes in the gate, and at that point it walks in the gate for processing, it's considered green. That's one level of SFI green. What we were saying is we wanted extraction practices to start the SFI standards, and working with the SFI board to encourage that. During our process, the European community actually requested in Viva, the, 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 uh, the uh, forest products uh, cor uh, company, to begin at that level. It was, I mean, again, I couldn't have asked them to do it better than that, but they said to ensure our products, our pellets are green for our consumer, we don't want it just from gate, we want it from point of extraction. So that really worked well in our situation. Um, looking at C in here, the, you know, identify the BMPs and preventative actions. You know, again, it's working in towards uh, conservation easements, working with regional um, conservation districts, applying those things that would protect wellhead areas, applying regular practices that may lead towards restoration and exclusion in areas that raise some cattle uh, within the watershed, um, maintaining, you know, uh, forest buffers uh, with minimal impacts through forestry activities, and then integrating some more regional plans that were there. So I'm skipping from C into, into E, looking at what were the pieces. And again, it leads into this is the who's who of what's going to happen. And I've chopped out six slides of this because it identified everybody. What's DCR's role, DEQ's role, TNC's role, the conservation districts, all the way down the list of what needs to be done. Obviously coordinated out of uh, heritage, but really to, to move that, uh, that process forward. Um, within G, this is now the identify the measurable milestones. It's to achieve over 20 years those 1,300 acres that were in there. And basically, we estimated just the labor costs in the previous one under, under F at about $10 million in just labor for that whole split of all those folks, not including the cost for actually implementing any of those practices. Um, and then the criteria that we want to uh, determine that it's a maintain at baseline conditions, again, that we're going back and we're using our same process, our integrity model, 
our uh, index of terrestrial integrity, and then assessing it through uh, through our um, uh, instar process one more time, um, and that we've maintained these these areas with minimal um, impacts, 150 um, 100 foot minimum width on buffers to you know, up to 150 preferred based on slopes, uh, protecting those those unique uh, communities that are in there, and then finally the last part here is looking at those those uh, time periods up to uh, you know up to 10 year intervals uh, for monitoring. So boy, I'm trying to blast through it, and I did blast through it. I went over. You did a great job at it, too, by golly. You, you, you've got Todd's contact information there. You've got it also in your attendee list. Thank you again, Todd. That was really good. Uh, very interesting approach. Um, catch Todd after we break here in a few minutes. If you have any questions, um, I know a lot of people have flight plans and stuff and need to get on the road, so we're going to wrap this thing up here. Um, hopefully, Todd, you can become a little bit more excited about this project as time goes on. Uh, that's good. Good job. All right, so I'm going to turn this over to Linda now, and she's going to move us to adjourn here in just a few minutes. Go ahead. Okay, sure. Hello, everybody. I'm not Linda, but she's up next. So just a couple of really quick announcements. Um, first off, thank you, everybody, for coming from all across the country and even farther than that to join us this week. We hope that you had a fantastic stay in Boston and a wonderful stay here at the Omni. So on behalf of New Epic, thank you, everybody. Um, as far as the evaluation surveys are concerned, I hope Barry drilled that into your head that please fill them out and drop them off at the registration desk on the way out. The more feedback you can give us, the better off this will be the next time around in 2018. Um, the name tags, you can drop those off at the registration desk as well. We will recycle and reuse those. Um, if Mark Voorhees is still here, I have your poster at the registration desk if you want it. Otherwise, we will recycle that. The PowerPoints, as have been mentioned, um, will be put on the New Epic Workshop website as PDFs. Anybody that registered for this uh, workshop, and we have your email, you will receive an email when those are uploaded. If you did not register or you didn't have a name tag when you arrived here, we don't have your email, so you can either leave it with us or just check the website in about a week or so, and those PowerPoints, or PDFs, excuse me, should be up. If anybody has any other logistical questions, um, you can ask me now or I'll be hanging around after the fact until everybody left, leaves. So thank you again, and Linda. Thank you, Kristen, and to our sponsor, Nui Pick. They did a fabulous job. Um, I also want to give one last shout out to Region 1, our host, very gracious, Sandra. Thank you. And also to Barry Tonning for running the show and keeping us musically inspired. So anyway, also just want to thank all of you, especially those of you that have hung out here till the end. There's so much that goes into making one of these successful. And the final analysis, it's about um, how much you all engage, listen, take from it, and, and share your questions. And I think you guys did a fantastic job of that. So thanks again to everybody. Safe travels home, and we'll see you in a couple of years. Bye.